indicate that your three minutes are up. Please wrap up your immediate sentence and move on. And uh, we've got quite a few people today. So we look forward to hearing as much as we can uh, from everyone. We are going to go ahead and uh, allow an hour uh, for the open public input period where originally we had 30 minutes. We don't want to exclude anyone. So with that, take it away, Tess. Fantastic. All right, so I'm going to move over to our caller with phone ending in 7323. And please state your name. Thank you. Yes, this is Frank Urbeck. I'm representing uh, sport fishing stakeholders at uh, Fish Baker Lake for sockeye. Uh, the popular recreational adult sockeye fisheries have occurred in this uh, beautiful Mount Baker setting since 2010. Uh, four years after the last sport caught, sockeye was taken from Lake Washington. I appreciate very much uh, the action by the commission at the December 14th, 2019 Bellingham meeting in response to demands from anglers that expressed outrage over the gross sockeye harvest inequity of the last seven seasons. There was 29,000 cumulative imbalance over the seven year period favoring the tribes with a 5,300 fish disparity in 2019. <clears throat> in response, the commission asked Ron Warren and Director Kelly Suswin to commit to discuss with the Skagit River Basin tribes various options for writing the imbalance for the 2020 fishery. Stakeholders had provided those options. It was my understanding from a number of follow-up discussions with Ron, this would be done. Reportedly, a brief conversation occurred in Vancouver, BC, but no substantive talks as had been promised. Consequently, nothing has changed. The 2020 preseason forecast lowest in a decade is 13,236 fish, allowing for a total harvest of only about 2,800 after broodstock and conservation requirements are met. My understanding is that the department and some of the tribes favor no fishing by anyone given the uncertainty of the forecast and limited ability to manage some of the fisheries. I can reluctantly accept this position going into the season in spite of the fact that only surplus sockeye would be released into Baker Lake. Therefore, the sport fishery could be fully controlled. I do ask that the commission encourage the department to consider an in-season management change that would allow a very limited Baker Lake sport fishery if indeed there are surplus sockeye taken at the concrete trap that could be released into the lake. This would be an appreciated token adjustment for the long-term inequity. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. Any questions for Mr. Yurbeck before we move on? Hearing none, thank you. Okay, Tess, uh, would you make sure too that the uh, the folks calling in announced their name as Frank did, so we have that for the record. Absolutely. Um, so the next person um, up to speak is on a phone number ending in 1990. So do go ahead and introduce yourself. Ken Miller, you're on deck. Hello, this is Rob Cavanaugh. And I'm calling to ask for your support on six different issues. Uh, the first issue, I would like to ask you to join with us in our appeal of the Department of Ecology a permit to spray a Mazamox on the eelgrasses of Willapa Bay. The second issue is I would like you to stop shooting band-tailed pigeons as you propose in WAC 220-416-060. Third issue, I ask that you do not allow the shooting of magpies and crows. Instead, use integrated pest control management and nets and acetylene guns. The fourth issue is, I would ask you to use ethical conduct when setting deer seasons. We have a situation in Klickitat County where I spend a lot of time and Yakima County where we've had large scale deer die off from disease and the agency has gone ahead and with no deer present according to your own biologist allowed the hunters unknowingly to come and try and hunt. 
this is not ethical. The state of Oregon had the same situation, and they did not do what Washington has done. Instead, they notified the hunters. All the white-tailed deer down here died, and so there would be no hunting season of white-tailed deer in northern Oregon. The fifth issue is please use good science, not emotions, in your cougar control. Uh, you do not seem to understand that killing these adult male cougars causes disruption of the social society of cougars and it makes it much more dangerous with these young male cougars roaming around. I was attacked by a young male cougar three years ago in Klickitat County and I shot it. The sixth issue is make it easier to get public records at the Department of Wildlife. Use transparency in government policy. I have six letters back from the department. I do not know what the subject is, and I have not been able to get a single letter of a daily or a weekly report from your archaeologist. So those are the issues I'm concerned about. Do you have any questions? No question. Thank you, Mr. Kavanaugh. Your comments are so noted. All right, Ken Miller, um, you're next, and Bob McCoy, you're on deck. And Ken, it looks like you may be um, kind of doubly muted. I've got you uh, unmuted on my end here, but wondering if on your computer, um, Okay. You've got an additional. Is that better? Meeting. That is much better. I can oh, hear you okay. clearly. Good morning, Chairman Carpenter and members of the commission. I'm Ken Miller, small forest landowner. I've testified before the commission numerous times over the years about the bear depredation program for uh, timber damage. Hopefully you've had a chance to read some of the written testimony my, from myself and Howard Wilson. Smalls are essential to the habitat and one size fits all rules just simply don't work for smalls for legitimate reasons. In a short time today, I just wanna to touch on three things, the good, the bad, and hopeful. The good, the department finally, yesterday, issued the 2020 rules late, uh, but for the season uh, that usually starts about next week. The bad, it's correctly titled Notice to the Industry. It's almost entirely about hound hunting for small forest landowners can't use hound hunting very often. I was one of the rare ones that could. It retains at least one discriminatory condition against smalls. The lawsuit was largely about hound hunting. The new rules are about hound hunting. Two to three years of collaboration with the department in 2015, 16, and 17 uh, that had win-win options for small landowners are gone. Hopeful, buried in the fine print of the aptly titled Notice to Industry, it implies that the department will actually work with small forest landowners on a case-by-case -case basis. I'm very hopeful for this if we use the best professional uh, uh, management options in the field by the experts in the field. We hope that this will generate uh, some good win-wins. And the final point is there's also uh, talks about plans to restart the stakeholder process. We've done that. We have spent many years, I've made several presentations to WDFW. Uh, we, it needs to start where we left off the last time we were doing these uh, negotiations and discussions and collaborations with the, the 2017 rules. There are lots of win-win opportunities. WFFA, who I'm a member of and represent, are very eager to help find these win-wins. They help landowners, help the habitat, help uh, the critters, and I think we'll even in the long term help those that care an awful lot about animals. So I'd love to take any questions. Thank you. Any questions of Mr. Miller? Hearing none. Ken, always a pleasure to hear your comments. Thank you. Look forward to hearing more. 
Okay, Tess, next. All right, um, Bob McCoy, you are up next, and uh, Deborah Chase, you're on deck. And Bob, do go ahead and look for that uh, little mute button on your computer as well. I've got you, there you go. Good morning, I'm Bob McCoy, Chair of the Mountain Lion Foundation, a national nonprofit organization and the resident of Washington for 58 years. I want to offer sound science and clear direction on the topic of cougar management. I believe we are all asking for the same thing, but we seem to see different methods we want to reduce the conflicts between humans and cougars while maintaining a healthy cougar population. What should matter is to reduce human conflicts, not to increase hunter opportunity. It is our belief that a successful program keeps the hunting quotas as they are because increasing them can bring increased conflicts for citizens in cougar country. The scientific data developed over decades clearly addresses this issue by recommending decreased cougar hunting to protect humans and livestock. Much of the scientific data was produced in Washington State using $9 million of taxpayers' money, and it clearly tells us one thing. There will be more conflicts, more depredations, and potentially more attacks on humans if WDFW rejects the science and increases cougar hunting. Studies from other states in British Columbia replicate these findings. Failure to remain below biologist guidelines leads to increased conflicts. We can't shoot our way out of a problem caused by too much shooting. To keep citizens and property safe from cougars, the department should use best science in order to reap the benefits of a stable cougar population. Recently published peer-reviewed studies that apply to this conversation Andre, 2020, research suggests that sports hunting actually exacerbates conflicts between pumas and humans. We recommend that state agencies reassess the use of sports hunting as a management tool for pumas. Teichman, 2016, counting for human density and habitat productivity, human hunting pressure during or before the year of conflict comprised the most important variables. Both were associated with increased male cougar human conflict. Peebles, 2013. Contrary to expectations, we found that complaints and depredations were most strongly associated with cougars harvested the previous year. The odds of increased complaints and livestock depredations increased dramatically by 36 to 240 percent with increased cougar harvest. Lambert, 2016. Indeed, increased complaints may accompany a rapidly declining population as shown here. Furthermore, increased hunting could actually result in increased cougar complaints because of the younger age structure of the cougar population and the higher proclivity of young animals to encounter humans and cause complaints. Do the right thing for the safety of citizens. Enforce the existing guidelines. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McCoy. Any questions of uh, Bob McCoy? Hearing none, thank you. Next, Tess. Great, and I wanna do a quick announcement um, because we have had some folks who have recently joined our line. Um, we are using the raise hand feature um, to uh, take public comment this morning. So if you've joined via your computer, please go ahead and look for that raise hand icon or if you're on the phone, um, do click star nine. We are using the question and answer area to be specifically technical questions. Um, like if somebody's audio got cut off um, or when we have slides further. Um, so I do know um, it looks like we have one person who has thrown some questions in the question and answer and I would encourage you um, to go ahead and um, raise your hand if you wanna say something. Um, and we're just working through people one by one. So I'm gonna go ahead to Deborah Chase and I've got Dan Paul on deck. And Deborah, do go ahead, perfect. Good morning, commissioners and WDFW staff. My name is Deborah Chase and I'm the CEO of the Mount Lion Foundation. 
I want to take a deep breath here and I want to enter into this conversation as someone that's pretty familiar with the passion and the importance of the subject. I work with over 13 states that have cougar populations and I can tell you that of the states that keep increasing their cougar hunts, they are the ones with the most conflicts, hands down. So let's all take a moment and go back in time to when our early settlers pushed for the extermination of the cougar. Those folks, along with the misguided conservationists of the time, also believe that the cougar was to blame for the lack of elk and deer populations. We now have decades of sound science to show that those early settlers were wrong. We know that cougars are capable of regulating their own numbers. Cougars and deer have co-evolved over thousands of years. As deer numbers decline, so naturally do cougars. As deer numbers grow, so do cougars. This dynamic has existed and functioned long before humans intervened. I know it's counterintuitive to you folks, but the science is pretty clear. Hunting more cougars increases conflicts and decreases deer and elk populations. The more researchers began to learn about these cats, the more they realized that cougars did not view humans as prey, that conflicts are exasperated by overhunting, that killing cougars to benefit game species like the deer were not effective, and that perhaps most importantly, cougar livestock conflicts could be prevented by implementing and properly using predator-proof enclosures and other deterrents, such as range riders and protector dogs. You said it yourself yesterday, there are more cougars being seen and less deer. That follows the increase in hunting tags that you're issuing. When you couple that with law enforcement also killing cougars, you've got a real situation brewing up there. Something to consider is that older cats tend to hunt elk while the younger cats favor the easier to manage deer. If you continue to hunt older males as suggested in options three and four at a maximum hunt rate, thinking it is protecting deer, it's gonna backfire on you because you're selecting cats that specialize in hunting deer. Without senior cats, territory will be open for younger ones to move into. The younger ones won't have the opportunity to learn to hunt their natural prey or to stay away from human areas. They will move in looking for food without, uh, without that kind of guidance. Again, increasing the problems. The science shows us option four could lead to more public safety problems. Keeping the status quo or at minimum choosing option one will save everyone a boatload of grief and will probably save lives. I know how hard it is to let go of old belief systems. But don't you think it's time to retire that old way of predator management? That kill as many as you can mentality that will just cause more damage? We sure do. We also ask that the Mountain Lion Foundation be at the table during any upcoming cougar study as an independent body offering input. We really can help. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Deborah. Any questions of Mrs. Chase? Hearing none. A uh, question of either Tess or Nikki. The uh, three minute buzzer, I don't know if it's gone off, but I, I'm it not just hearing. went off for the first time with Deborah, but it was a little bit quiet. So Melissa's going to try and get that a little closer to her mic. Okay, next, uh, next person, please. All right, next, uh, we've got Dan Paul, and then we've got a phone number ending in 3579, who's going to be on deck. All right, good morning, uh, Chair Carpenter and members of the Commission. Uh, my name is Dan Paul, and I'm the Washington Senior State Director for the Humane Society of the United States. On behalf of the HSCOS and our supporters in Washington, I strongly oppose all four of the proposals the Commission is considering to expand the recreational hunting of cougars in our state. I have submitted multiple comment letters in opposition to these proposals, which we know are not supported by the majority of Washingtonians. We did a telephone poll and submitted that uh, result to the Commission as well last week. Um, and these proposals will not serve as any long-term solutions to mitigate conflicts with cougars. In fact, Washington's own research shows that these proposals could develop increased conflicts and undercuts the efforts currently underway to develop sound solutions. On behalf of the HSUS, I've served in DFW stakeholder groups with discussions to find solutions for cougars with, with, for conflicts with cougars. One solution that's already underway is the hound handler training program. Another discussion centered on uh, unregulated feeding of ungulates, which attract cougars to move closer into communities has been um, bandied about. For years, we have been willing to sit with the department, with county commissioners, ranchers, hunters, houndsmen, 
any other any stakeholder out there to participate and find creative and collaborative actions that our state can take to reduce conflicts and better coexist with cougars. We have exceptional state funded state specific cougar research that we should be leaning on, which shows that increased hunting will destabilize the cougar population and lead to increased conflict. So for you um, to approve these, any of these four, it divides our state further, it undercuts any future stakeholder process and puts the trust in the agency, which they worked so hard to build up in jeopardy with those of us who have participated with good faith in finding shared solutions. Instead of approving one of these four proposals to increase recreational hunting of cougars, we implore the commission to direct the department to conduct more research on cougar conflicts and build up upon the science we currently have, currently have and depend upon to learn why certain regions have more conflict and to see if and why the densities of cougars is higher in some areas and lower in others. We ask that you reject these proposals and any others that will increase the recreational hunting of cougars in Washington and let's allow the hound handler program to get off the ground and um, and see how that works and also fund science and outreach to help address citizen concerns. Thank you so much for the opportunity this morning. Thank you, Dan. Any questions of Dan? Hearing none. Thank you. Next uh, commenter. All right, we've got um, a phone number ending in 3579 is going to be going next. And then on deck, we've got a phone number ending in 4523. And please state your name for the record. Okay, uh, my name is Kelly Bush. Can you hear me? Yes, very clearly. Okay, Kelly Bush, Rockport, Washington. My comment concerns the commission's consideration to increase cougar hunting. My message is to ask, please do not increase the trophy hunting limits on cougars in Washington state. I'm a rural resident of Skagit County for over 30 years. I am a wildlife enthusiast and therefore I am for the protection and not the trophy hunting of these non-food wildlife. Please do not select any of the four alternatives or make any changes if it increases the number of cougars that will be hunted. While I have a wildlife sciences degree from ages ago and a 30 year land management career behind me in the North Cascade, I make these comments from my citizen interest to protect wildlife in this state. But more importantly, from what the science recently shows that increased hunting results in increased human and cougar problems. Many of these studies have already been cited this morning, but I'll mention the Washington State University study by Robert Wilgus and other academics that advocated for not increasing cougar hunts and in fact cites that the 2013 WDFW adopted the current plan based on this study's findings and recommendations. Please do not increase cougar hunting in any way. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly, for your comments. Any questions? Hearing none, uh, next commenter, please. All right, I've got a uh, person called in on a phone number ending in 4523. And then Perry um, Menchaca, you're up next. Uh, good morning, Commission uh, Chair Carpenter and Commission and Deck Director Suswin. Greg King here. Um, I'm not gonna be talking about Cougars this morning. I want to talk a little bit about uh, the two policies we have in place, uh, Columbia River policy and Willapal policy. And I'll start with Willapal policy. <laughs> um, I think I la asked one of the last times I talked about pound nets and where we are at pound, on pound nets um, uh, on the Columbia River. And, and I, I didn't get any, maybe I did get some information back on that, but I, I, never, uh, I, never, I never looked at it or never saw it or missed it. Um, sports are not happy with pound nets. Um, they only pass wild fish above, and that's not that's not uh, that's not a good thing for sports fishing. Um, we just want to know. We want some clarification from the commission on pound nets and staff. Staff has done a great review of the Columbia River policy. Kudos to staff. Um, it shows in that report that that Columbia River policy isn't working for anybody. Commercials aren't getting one more fish in their box, and we're not getting more one more day as wrecks on the water. Um, those are my concerns with the policy, and and just both these policies. I I think we need to stop kicking the can down the road. I mean that's what it feels like we're doing, and I'm not trying to be uh, uh, 
uh, sarcastic or, or what's the words I want to use. I'm not trying to be mean or anything like that. I just think we need to um, move on these policies. Willapaw Bay, I'll move on to Willapaw Bay. It is, it, we know we've been struggling with Willapaw Bay for since the conception of the policy. The, even, the, even the sports advisors realize, some of them, that this policy just isn't working for us. And, and, and the thing about that, that gets us all is we have no tribal influence there. It's just sports and the state and the commercials. And, and this could be such a great fishery for us. And, and it's another thing that we just seem to kick the can down the road. And, and, and we need some guidance. We need to get these policies taken care of. Um, and, uh, you know, just an update on the pound nets. And, and, and where we are at with these policies and what's what's going on. Let's let's get these things taken care of. Uh, you know, a lot of people think we should just start over on them. And I feel that way, too. We should just, you know, can the policies that we have and and let's start over and, and write them uh, and get every get all the get all the uh, uh, user groups in there to sit at the table and and discuss these policies and get good policies. I mean, they're not, not saying that the whole thing's all bad, but it's just, they're not working. So anyway, that's my comments today. Thank you. Greg, thanks for calling in. Any questions of Greg? Okay, thank you. Moving on to test. Great, and uh, we've got Perry up next, followed by a phone number ending in 5985. And again, we do have a few more folks that have joined the line. If you were hoping to say something during public input this morning, um, please raise your hand using the raised hand icon if you've joined via the computer or star nine on your phones. All right, Perry, um, go ahead. And Perry, you will want to look on your computer as well um, for the unmute option um, in the lower left. There we go. How's that? Perfect. All right. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today. Are you are you able to hear me now clearly? Yes. Perfect. Uh, Chair Carpenter, over four long years ago, you told the citizens of this state that you fully support open meetings and transparency in the fisheries. Additionally, you promised to do everything in your power to end the prohibition that is, the, that is blinding the public and which the state's Open Public Meeting Act demands. Yet, here we are at the end of yet another North of Falcon process and the public is still met with locked doors and secret deals. We still have no solution to the permitting issue that allows for leverage to gain advantage over WDFW and prevents a fair and equal share of the resources, as is the law under the Bolt Agreement. We've recently heard the department use words transparency and public participation much like someone would use a paper plate at a picnic. Useful at the moment, but easily discarded. Repeating the words over and over again does not make them real. The public is smarter than that. You profess a dedication to open government, yet you allow hundreds of thousands of taxpayer dollars to be wasted fighting transparency in the courts. When pressed, you throw your hands up in the air and say, we're helpless to do anything about it. But your facade of helplessness is just a mask for your culpability in the continuation of this miscarriage of public trust. For four long years, and no one has provided a sound justification for why it is essential to make harvest sharing decisions in secret. So Chair Carpenter, please tell the hundreds of thousands of stakeholders who is ultimately responsible for this public prohibition. Who do we turn to to end the culture of secrecy? If not you, who? Thank you. Thank you, Perry. Any questions of Perry? Hearing none, moving on, next, Tess. 
Great. I've got a phone number ending in 5985 and then Robert Kinder, um, we've got you on deck. Good morning, Commission, and thank you for the opportunity to speak with you this morning. Can you hear me clearly? Yes, please state your name for the record. My name is Cindy Neff, and I would like to comment on the department's Cougar proposals. I'm a native resident of Washington and do not want to see any increase in the recreational cougar hunt. I recognize there is always public safety and property damage threats with cougars, but WDFW already has a, day, a way to deal with those legitimate issues. Keeping a stable cougar population is the most effective way to keep cougars from becoming a risk to humans, pets, and livestock. Thank you for taking my comments this morning. Thank you for your comments, Cindy. Any questions of Cindy? Hearing none, uh, thank you. Uh, Tess, next commenter, please. All right, Robert Kinder, you're next, followed by Chris Bachman. And Robert, make sure to look for that microphone on the bottom left on your computer. Good morning, everyone. My question is, when can we expect the uh, recreational clam season to reopen? And as far as uh, access to private lands, we're, we, from what I understand, as a state, we, we offer uh, tax incentives to private corporations who charge fees for access to, to their lands. And I'm wondering if uh, there's any way that we can get them to open those lands up to all the recreational hunters. Robert, was that, does that conclude your comments? Yes, sir, it does. Thank you very much. Any questions of Robert? Hearing none, thank you very much. Uh, Tess, next, please. All right. Um, Chris, we've got you next, followed by uh, Heath. And uh, just one more note, um, if you do want to provide public input and you joined this meeting a little bit later, um, if you're on the phone, press star nine to raise your hand and we will call on you. Or if you have joined via your computer, please look for that raise hand icon. Chris, go ahead. And Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Good morning, Chair Carpenter and Commissioners. Uh, my name is Chris Bachman. I'm the Wildlife Program Director at the Spokane Based Lands Council. Uh, like the Humane Society and others, we oppose all four options proposed and support no cougar hunting and certainly no increase in cougar hunting until the current population of cougars in Washington State is known. Increasing harvest when the population is unknown has no scientific basis. Perceived danger from cougars is outweighing the evidence and the science. Wildlife management should be based in science, not in politics or perception. It's time we recognize the valuable ecological role predators play in ecosystems and stop overplaying their threats to human safety and livestock and their competition for wild ungulates. We do understand there will be occasion for public safety removal of cougars. And there's a new study by John Landre, the elephant in the room, what we can learn from California regarding the use of sport hunting for cougars. The study shows no significant distance between states that allow cougar hunting and California, which does not allow cougar hunting in human conflict, livestock conflict, et cetera. Appreciate the opportunity to comment. Thank you. Thank you, Chris, for your comments. Any questions of Chris? Hearing none, uh, Tess next. Sure. Um, Heath, you're up next, and then Marie, um, you're on deck. Good morning, commissioners. Can you hear me? Yes. All right. Well, uh, happy Good Friday to you all. Um, the times that we're living in, I hope you're all safe. Uh, it, it's in vogue to be a public health official these days, uh, Commissioner Thorburn. So uh, thank you to, to you all for the opportunity to comment. Uh, I'm going to just uh, mention uh, what is unfolding right now at North of Falcon and really encourage uh, you guys to be looking into that now and then once the final agreement is struck. 
Uh, I'm going to focus my comments on Puget Sound. I think many of you are aware that uh, the sport fishing community, uh, CCA, Northwest Marine Trade Association, have uh, raised a lot of concerns about the change to uh, uh, put an exploitation rate limit on marked hatchery still Aguamish Chinook. And we have said we think this is going to have debilitating impacts on marked selective fisheries throughout Puget Sound. Uh, we were told uh, here in the last several months that modeling from the department, they weren't, they thought they could manage through it. Uh, what we are hearing, and the, the deal is not struck, but what we are hearing, it could be devastating to recreational fisheries in Puget Sound. The complete loss of the winter blackmouth fishery is being talked about in the entire north of Puget Sound. Uh, right now, there are talks about further reductions uh, in sport fisheries. I want to make it very clear that, uh, and we'll look at the information after it's over, that this is not going to have conservation benefits to increase escapements of wild and hatchery uh, still Aguamish Chinook, uh, and that what it will actually do is just simply uh, result in uh, more uh, shifting the imbalance that already exists in harvest sharing uh, between state and tribal even further. Uh, so I would encourage you to really look after this agreement struck and look at what conservation benefit did it have in terms of getting uh, more Chinook to the still of Wamish, uh, hatchery and wild for that matter, uh, and what did it actually do uh, on, you know, out there on the water to the fisheries. So thank you for the opportunity to comment. Uh, take care of yourselves. Thank you, Heath, for your comments. Any questions of Heath? Hearing none. Next, Tess. All right. Marie, you are next. And at this point, we have no others with their hand raised. If you had um, been wanting to make public comment, um, but had just joined, um, it is star nine if you are on your phone um, or look for that hand raise icon. So thank you, Marie, um, go ahead. Thank you commissioners for this opportunity to speak. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Wonderful. My name is Marie Newmiller, and I am the Executive Director for the Inland Northwest Wildlife Council. Our representatives have reached out to the Commission in writing several times regarding the antler point requirements. Unfortunately, due to the statewide closure of gatherings on March 13th, we were unable to attend the Commission meeting to discuss this issue as we were forced to begin the long and arduous process of shutting down the Bighorn Show. The opinion of the Wildlife Council has not changed since our first correspondence with you. We oppose adding antler restrictions as data provided by Fish and Game does not indicate there is a biological or conservation need to initiate antler restrictions. We favor the any buck rule in Northeastern Washington, which provides more sustainable hunting opportunities for our members and their families, as well as the participants in our Americans with Disabilities Access Program. In regards to cougars, the Inland Northwest Wildlife Council believes in science-based conservation and wildlife management. We urge the commission to look closely at the numbers in Eastern Washington area. We cannot use statewide hunting regulations and season end dates to control cougars. Our numbers need to be geared towards each area as cougar populations are not proportionate throughout the state. Through a cooperative effort between fish and game scientists and the hunting community, we can work to effectively manage cougar populations and reduce their conflicts. We have worked with the commission for many years, representing a group of over 500 members. Myself, our representatives, and our members will continue to provide both, both written and public content to the commission. Thank you for your time and careful consideration. Thank you, Marie, for your comments. Any questions of Marie? Hearing none, Tess, does that wrap up uh, we have three more folks, um, and then we'll be wrapped up. Thank you. So we have a phone number ending in 9857. Go ahead and talk. Yeah, and this is Gary Kohler. Uh, I'd like to make comments on the Cougar Harvest uh, 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 options. I retired from the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife as uh, the wildlife research scientist for carnivore investigations in 2011. I conducted research on black bears, lynx, and cougars during this time. I co-authored many of the publications that, uh, and, and was principal investigator for much of the cougar work that has been published in the state. You know, we've been here before, 25 years ago, following 
the 1996 citizen initiative to ban use of hounds to hunt cougars and bears and bobcats. In response to that, WDFW is concerned that cougar numbers would explode or dramatically increase without the effective use of hounds. And so they addressed this concern by, uh, after the ban was in place, to increase harvest quotas for cougars, to increase season length for harvest, to reduce harvest tag fees, to encourage hunter effort to prevent this hypothetical increase in cougar numbers and uh, accompanying complaints. Washington at that time had no significant understanding of cougars in the state. Numbers, density, distribution, how they mingle in, in increasingly developed rural landscapes. So Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife began to help sponsor university uh, efforts and conducted their own research, much of what I was lead to. That design included replicate and long-term research, hallmarks of rigorous scientific investigation with five replicate study areas in various habitats and geographic regions in Washington. All of this con was conducted over a 16 year period of field investigations. Results show similar densities of cougars throughout these five areas. For animals 18 months old or greater and resident adults, calculations uh, of cougar density was 1.5 to 2.8 cougars per 100 square kilometers. 100 square kilometers is about 40 square miles or a little larger than a township. This information was made, made available and is available to WDFW. These findings are currently in preparations. The um, uh, recent um, estimates and comparative studies of of cougar numbers in the five areas is being prepared for publication at this time. Uh, these estimates do not represent or uh, anything close to four cougars per 100 square kilometers as presented by some in the department. Mm -hmm. Estimates may approach four cougars per 100 uh, square That's your kilometers. three minute mark, Gary. Okay. Can you go ahead uh, and wrap any up questions? Your Wrap up. Yeah, please. Please. Sure. Okay, uh, when including kittens, the research has shown in an area northeast where cougar hunters or where cougar harvest has been 24%, similar densities to central Washington where there was 11%. So these two areas had a very similar uh, harvest or uh, density. This density was different in the fact that the northeast was comprised mainly of young age. Uh, cougars that have been uh, immigrated into the area to establish home ranges. And um, these are, uh, whenever you harvest a cougar or over harvest area, you're creating a large dense uh, uh, vacancy, a population sink attractive to uh, dispersal aged animals. This is likely what's happening in what is being seen currently in the Northeast now, and probably explains the presumed or assumed high density of cougars. Gary, could we uh, uh, could we wrap yeah. up and see if there's any questions from the commission members? Yeah, uh, I'll finish right now. I uh, uh, will take questions at this time. First of all, thank you very much for calling in and your comments. Uh, any questions from the commission? Okay, Gary, thank you very much. Tess, next. You bet, thank you. Yes, so uh, we have a phone number ending in 4004. So go ahead and introduce yourself and then Matt Simonson, um, you will be our last um, person today with public comment. Good morning, commissioners. This is Sophia Ressler with Center for Biological Diversity and thankfully I finally got that star nine to work. So um, I appreciate you hearing my testimony. Um, I'm here just to really reiterate what many people have already said. Um, 
and to ask that the um, department keep the current harvest quotas for cougars and work to enforce and enhance management activities using the rules as they already exist. And um, that is based on, you know, the, uh, the science that has been around, the science that just recently came out um, only two months ago, um, which many have already cited to that, that shows that sport hunting of cougars really does not give us the management results that um, that are expected and also the department's current harvest quota that's set at 12 to 16 percent is is supported by on the ground research it's supported by the department's own biologists and it's chosen to preserve the social structure and maintain the ecological function of the cougar population um, I fear that if the department adopts any of the choices that are in, or sorry, if the commission adopts any of the choices that are in front of them today, that we actually are going to exacerbate the problem that um, the commission is trying to solve. And so I um, implore the commission to not choose any of those four options in front of them and um, keep the, the current harvest quotas um, and work on enforcing and enhancing those management activities uh, within the harvest quotas as they exist right now. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you very much, Sophia. Any questions of Sophia? Hearing none, Tess, that last, uh, or I guess, do we have one or two more now? It looks like we've got two more. So we've got Matt um, now and Fred Kuntz next. All right. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you, Matt. Perfect. Uh, so my name is Matt Simonson. I am a resident of the state of Washington. Uh, I would uh, very much like to thank the commission uh, for uh, this early Friday uh, call during this uh, time of uncertainty, uh, as well as I'd like to thank Gary for all the uh, scientific uh, fact that he presented uh, you know, very fact-based, and I appreciate it. It was not uh, not uh, subjective. Um, overall, uh, you know, I, I, you know, right coming out and saying it, uh, you know, I am in favor of increasing uh, harvest uh, quotas. Um, however, uh, I'm not going to uh, belabor that point. Uh, I think that uh, I, I want to stick with just thanking the commission as well as anyone who has called in uh, for being involved in this state. Uh, WDFW uh, has, you know, it, it's a very contentious relationship with the, the people of this state. And I just want to commend everyone who has been involved in the process, uh, whether I agree or not, uh, as I look at this uh, conference. Uh, it's cool seeing everyone from all the all the different walks of life sitting in you know whether it's a fake backdrop or real backdrop I think it's just commendable that uh, y'all are involved uh, and you know being being present so um, the one question I did have uh, very quickly here uh, was whether uh, and this was to Bob McCoy and Deborah Chase uh, was do you have any specific metrics that, that identify the conflict separately between the depredation of livestock and human conflict uh, the small percentage of conflicts with humans does not seem to support the overall assumption of conflict uh, and then finally my last question uh, was uh, you know, predator predator management. Um, are we saying that we just don't manage the population? Um, you know, is is just not hunting? Is that is that going to uh, be the solution that, that we need? Um, but but overall, just want to thank everyone for being involved, whether we agree or not. I think it's important that uh, that everyone's at the table. So thank you all. Uh, thank you, Matt. Any questions of Matt? Hearing none, uh, Tess, you have one more, I guess? Yes, all right. Um, Fred Kuntz, um, why don't you go ahead and make sure to look for that unmute button on the left. Yep. Uh, good morning, commissioners and everyone. I just had a general comment. You know, as I sat here this morning and watched all your faces on the little Zoom windows, I couldn't help but think about the pandemic 
and what brought that here, brought us here, and whether we can learn anything from the pandemic that would guide the commission and guide all of us moving forward in the matters of the environment. You know, the pandemic, it didn't have to happen. It was human caused. It's not some natural event. It was caused because over the last 20 years or more, there was a failure, a reluctance to listen to experts. Experts like Gary Kohler, who you just heard from. A failure to improve communication among agencies. Our four natural resource agencies, they get less than 2% of the state budget. And despite their hard work, they're not working in any kind of real coordinated plan for the ultimate purpose of what we're here to do. And that's to build a future sustainable environment for our children. Over and over again, the pandemic and all these environmental problems, they're ultimately caused by prioritizing always the short-term economic growth over long-term health. And we keep missing opportunities to make changes. These failures in Olympia and among really all of us, how many disasters like the pandemic are gonna have to happen before our, our leaders, before our politicians, before the legislature, before they decide that enough is enough. Our children's future is at stake. We have to make changes. You know, now's the time. No more Band-Aids. Bold steps are required. Courage among you, the commissioners, among our leaders has to be made. Yeah, you know, everybody knows that Fish and Wildlife and the Natural Resource Agencies, you know, the first step is to increase the spending. You don't have enough resources. I appreciate and know how hard all the staff are working. But, you know, simultaneously with that has to become a true realigning of missions and work plans. You know, it's got to be less about managing recreation and consumption and more about conserving biodiversities and ecosystems, and including, of course, protecting the non-living components like air and water. You know, this won't be easy or cheap. Everybody has to sacrifice. One good thing of the pandemic is seeing how much people do want to work together and how much we can stop all the politicizing and polarization when it comes to survival. That's what we're talking about here. This won't be easy. But you know, get over it. And ironically, who would have thought that the pandemic might be our children's best hope of the future if only the adults would realize what were our really priorities, have some courage, and listen to the experts? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Koontz. Appreciate your comments. Any uh, questions from the commission? Hearing none. Okay, Tess, does that wrap up the open public input section? I believe it does. Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you very much to all the individuals that took the time to call in and participate. We will move to um, agenda item two, uh, which is a, a commission discussion. So I'll open it up for uh, uh, any commissioners to uh, make comments, share their stories. Who would like to go first? Kim, I see a hand up. Do you want to go first? Commissioner Thorburn. Thank you. Um, I have a couple of things that I'm going to talk about. Um, first, uh, those of us who are um, commissioners in the Eastern Washington Commission seats, um, had a wonderful um, meeting a week ago, last Friday, with the um, leadership of uh, the uh, staff leadership of Region One. It was hosted by uh, Regional Director Steve Pazengra, and uh, we also heard from uh, the uh, Enforcement Captain um, Dan Ron, uh, the uh, Habitat Program Manager. Um, Mark Wechtel, the Fish Program Director, Chris Donnelly, um, the Wildlife Program Director, uh, Kevin Robinette, and uh, their Lands um, Manager, uh, Jared uh, uh, Pluff. And uh, we just 
uh, uh, the discussion focused on um, a lot of the issues that are before the commission from a region one perspective. It was most informative and um, I think it's something that uh, we Eastern Washington commissioners are hoping to do in our three Eastern Washington um, regions. Uh, it really is helpful to get a regional perspective on these issues that are before the commission. Uh, and I just want to really reach out and thank uh, those staff members who uh, spent uh, practically all day in a, a virtual um, conference with us. Uh, the second thing I want to bring up is um, <clears throat> I'm going to put on an old hat. Uh, Heath referred to it, and that is my public health hat. Um, and I'm going to reach out and speak to my former colleagues, the local public health officers um, and uh, the local public health officials. Um, I saw an article yesterday uh, where um, in one of our rural counties, uh, the local health official um, was meeting with the county commissioners and um, made the statement um, really, and this was uh, outreach from our department, uh, made the statement that um, if we allow hunting, uh, it, um, it could lead to a second wave of the uh, pandemic. And I just want to note that that statement is baseless. Uh, there's no evidence that uh, regulated hunting and um, maybe adding a regulation of social distancing um, sp uh, spreads uh, the uh, SARS-CoV-2, which is the virus that causes COVID-9. Um, there's there's absolutely no evidence of that. Um, and uh, furthermore, there's no evidence that a hunter stopping in a gas station uh, to fill up his, his rig or her rig uh, on the way to hunt spreads SARS-CoV-2. Um, health emergency authority is very extensive and it can be abused. And I would just ask my former colleagues to consider that um, as we move forward to try and contain this outbreak, we shouldn't make unreasonable restrictions on our human rights. Um, with that, I'm done with my comments. Thank you, Commissioner Thorburn. Uh, anyone else? Uh, this is Dave Graybill. Commissioner Graybill. Uh, first of all, Kim, thank you for those comments. Um, you know, we're, all of us are receiving a lot of emails and comments about uh, the closures of our fishing seasons and hunting seasons. And I appreciate your perspective. And I know there's a lot of alternatives and options that have been presented to us and to the governor's office and the department. And I hope those are getting consideration within uh, the boundaries of reasonable health concerns. Uh, I'm very glad you brought that up, Kim, and I hope these options are being considered uh, to provide some sort of reasonable path forward on our hunting and fishing opportunities. Uh, I also appreciated the meeting we had with our region one folks. Um, and that reminded me, and I think the um, email from uh, Kelly Susswund, our director, just came out today about the retirement of Jim Brown in Region 2. Um, I want to acknowledge the great work that Jim has done. I think all of our commissioners are probably uh, familiar with his uh, work in Region 2 and uh, the great work that he's done. It's been a real asset to the department. He'll be gravely missed. And uh, it's unfortunate that I, well, I'm looking forward to uh, seeing who is placed in that position. And I look forward to uh, meeting with the new regional director from that area. But there's uh, great staff uh, in place now uh, that will continue to do the good work in Region 2 for the department. Thanks. Thanks, Jared. Thank you, Commissioner Graybell. Uh, anyone else have any comments or 
stories of interest to share? Okay. Donald. Uh, Commissioner. Oh, Commissioner McIsey. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just very briefly, uh, let me uh, also thank Commissioner Thorburn for a perspective on this. We've heard a lot of public testimony. Uh, we've read a lot of public testimony. We heard some public testimony today, and I think each one of us is hearing quite a bit about the statewide recreational fishing closure and hunting closures as well. I don't know that there's a spot on the agenda where what happens next comes up maybe at the end of the meeting. Uh, the current emergency situation, I think, uh, goes through May 4th. And so uh, I think it might be a good uh, time at some point during this meeting, I'm not sure when or on our next conference call, for some sort of uh, policy level discussion about what happens after May 4th decision on May 4th. So it's just an issue that's getting a enormous amount of discussion and it's not currently on our agenda anywhere. We can't really raise it, I guess, for any discussion in, in substance depth right now. Uh, thank you, Commissioner McIsaac. Uh, we are going to have a a wrap-up section at the uh, as a last agenda item at the end of the day as uh, uh, to fill in a little bit after the, the uh, cancellation of our executive session. So we will have an opportunity to discuss various issues at the end of, at the end of today's meeting. Uh, any other uh, commissioners uh, have any other comments? Okay, thank you all. Chair we'll Carpenter, move on. Chair Carpenter, this is Commissioner Linville. Commissioner Linville. Sorry about that, I, I had my hand up, but... Um, so I just want to um, sort of chime in and add my voice to the conversation. I think we have a really unique opportunity in having Commissioner Thorburn on the commission with us to, um, with some real credible guidance from her. I think it is absolutely a commission's role um, in this really unprecedented time to provide solid steps out of this because we're not going to remain in this, you know, sort of you know, uh, I don't know <laughs> what the word is for it forever. And so I think that we need, as a commission, need to provide clear guidance on next steps out of here and how to get back to normal life because this is, um, yeah, we're not gonna stay here forever. So, um, and I just think that having Commissioner Thorburn is just a really useful and um, amazing gift to the commission. So I just wanted to say we need to be working on that. Thank you, Commissioner Linville. Uh, any, uh, anything else from anyone? Okay, thank you all. We'll go to uh, item B, meeting minute approval. Commissioner Thornburn. You're muted. Trying to, yes, <laughs> trying to find all the buttons to push. Okay, so we have on um, two sets of minutes to approve. I'll take each one separately. Uh, I move to approve the uh, March 13th Washington Fish and Wildlife Commission meeting minutes as submitted. I second that. Okay, we have a motion by uh, Commissioner Thorburn and a second by Commissioner Anderson. Uh, do we have any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, aye. same sign. <laughs> Motion carries. Thank you. Okay, so I will move on to the second set of minutes. I move to approve the March 27th Washington Fish and Wildlife teleconference minutes as submitted. Second. Again, we have a motion by uh, Commissioner Thorburn and a second by Commissioner Anderson. Uh, before I call for the question, I see Joe Pinesco's come online. Joe, Joe do you have uh, comments or guidance? Um, yes, I do have one comment on these minutes from the conference call. With respect to the, the minutes, uh, portion of the minutes as to the delegation order, um, as the minutes are written, it shows Commissioner Kehoe making a motion and then has the language from his initial motion 
but the language that that was typed in the minutes was actually the final language that was approved. Uh, and so the, the I, after, after it was amended, if the commissioners remember that it was amended, and which which is also the fact of the amendment is captured in the minutes as well. The easiest fix that I recommend is simply to move the the block quote of the delegation language uh, down to after the line main motion as amended passed unanimously. Um, so, so I would recommend that the, when the, the top line says Commissioner Kehoe made a motion seconded by Commissioner Smith, after the comma, I would just say uh, made a motion second, meant seconded by Commissioner Smith uh, to delegate uh, authority to the director and just leave it at that. There's no need in the minutes to set forth the language of the original motion since the minutes capture that it was then amended and then the final language as amended would follow that. So that's that's my suggestion. Um, you know, if, if anyone has any other input, I'm absolutely happy to consider it. Any follow up to uh, Mr. Podesco's comments? Nikki, you got all that regarding the minutes? Okay. I, we'll go back now, if I may, to the March 27th motion and second motion made by Commissioner Thorburn, seconded by Commissioner Anderson. Is there any further discussion on that motion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. That motion carries. Thank you very much. Uh, next item on uh, 2C is uh, committee reports. Um, it was a busy day yesterday, and I'm going to let, uh, uh, regarding the fish committee, I'm going to let uh, first uh, uh, Commissioner McIsaac uh, do a briefing as he's put in a lot of work on this. So, uh, uh, Commissioner McIsaac. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and can you hear me okay? Yes. Yeah, okay. Uh, the Fish Committee met yesterday, April 9th, 2020, by conference call. The agenda and materials were posted on the Commission website prior to the meeting. All Fish Committee members were present. Also in attendance were Commissioners Baker, Thorburn, Anderson, and Linville. Commission staff Nikki Klupfer, Attorney General's Office Counsel Joe Panesco, and Department staff members Kelly Cunningham, Lori Peterson, and Kurt Hughes. Approximately 12 members of the public were also on the call. The Fish Committee discussed materials associated with the topic of providing guidance on the development policy language revision on the matter of developing policy language revisions to policy 3619. The Fish Committee reached a unanimous recommendation to the Commission to consider under agenda This recommendation is shown below and is posted on agenda item eight. And I'm reading from the Fish Committee report in writing that's available on the website. Uh, I won't go into the specifics of the recommendation. Uh, it's not just posted here under the committee reports. It's also posted under agenda item eight, so as to facilitate public comment uh, later in the day when we get to that. I might also note that prior to the committee consideration of this recommendation, the Fish Committee heard a report on a meeting with tribal co-manager policy representatives where they offered their policy perspectives on the question of language revisions to policy 3619. And that concludes my report. Thank you, Commissioner McIsaac. Any questions? That um, 3619 Hatchery Policy Review Briefing and Public Comment period is uh, on our agenda today for about 11.10, so we can move on. Uh, we also had the Wildlife Committee uh, virtual meeting yesterday. Uh, we did. Um, so this is Commissioner Thorburn. I just uh, note, I, I did not, I was not in attendance of the Fish Committee meeting that was mentioned. I was out listening to Best for Sparrows. Um, so uh, the Wildlife Committee met uh, and we had several things on the agenda. Uh, the first was a discussion of the uh, Cougar's Harvest re recommendations that are before the Commission and I'm not going to discuss that any further. We do have a recommendation uh, that we're going to bring forward uh, and we'll talk about that uh, during that agenda item. We also um, took a little bit deeper dive on uh, the 
uh, the um, issues and questions that came up around uh, predator prey management um, in our Kennewick meeting, uh, there was quite a bit of discussion um, during the uh, presentations on the Ungulant game rules uh, about, and we've also received a lot of test, a lot of testimony from constituents about predator prey management. Um, and uh, we just uh, spent a little bit of time um, discussing uh, the current um, department approach and uh, the significance of that approach. It was a good discussion. And then um, finally, I, acknowledging uh, the testimony of uh, Mr. Kim Miller, who's uh, provided testimony before the commission on a number of occasions and just um, thanking him for his uh, long time involvement in the issue of um, bear damage to small forest landowners uh, operations. Um, it, we, uh, we have seen some, uh, the, the commission seen some concerns raised um, just in the last few days. So we talked about um, the department's response, um, acknowledged that uh, it, it uh, was a little bit delayed. Um, actually, department response to this issue has been on hold because of litigation uh, for the past couple of years. And, and the, uh, the um, program is resuming now, and, as well as uh, the public process to move it forward. So um, we talked about that. Um, it just got a little bit of information. And again, uh, I want to recognize uh, Mr. Miller and all of the, the uh, thank you for being here today. And um, thank you for all of the time and effort that you've put into this. Uh, hopefully, um, we'll eventually reach a sweet spot with this policy. Um, do any of the other uh, committee members have any comments? <clears throat> Thank you, Commissioner Thorburn. Um, okay, that wraps up agenda item two. We will move to agenda item three. This is a director's report. I think today it's gonna be the deputy director's report, Amy. Hi, thank you, Chair Carpenter. Um, happy to be with you all here today. The director continues in negotiations around North of Falcon, so he's not able to join us, but he says hello to you all. Um, I'm gonna start with some of the good news. So the governor did sign WFW's budget um, our structural deficit has been resolved, which puts us on sound financial footing, even as we begin to address the upcoming hard times that we anticipate. We receive more general fund than ever before, which is an incredible recognition of the broad-based funding support for our mission. Uh, the legislature provided 27 million in state general fund from the supplemental operating budget um, that will fund the department's core services through June of 2021 and allocate significant resources for new work. The ongoing dollars are very close to fully funding today's need in out years. Um, it's a huge improvement. Since the legislature passed its budget, about a month went by as the governor's office uh, continued to review the budget. Um, as you know, in that intervening month, uh, COVID-19 hit the state of Washington, uh, and we began to see our economic forecast uh, begin to, to collapse a bit. Um, the governor's office uh, made approximately 150 vetoes throughout the 2020 supplemental operating budget to begin to align the state budget with the anticipated loss of tax revenue. The areas vetoed were described by the governor as proposed appropriations in new investment areas. He vetoed about $235 million, um, but it did not impact current service levels. We anticipate the governor is gonna convene a special session to begin to align the state with the budget revenue and perhaps tap the $3 billion of state reserves in order to respond to the COVID-19. On the policy side, um, House Bill 2571, our enforcement civil authority bill, which provides officers the option to cite low level fish and wildlife violations as an infraction versus a misdemeanor um, passed. And Senate Bill 6072 separates the state wildlife account into a flexible account and a restricted, restricted account, which helps us with visibility around our structural budget challenges in the future. So um, out of this legislative session, uh, there were a lot of really positive outcomes for the Department of Fish and Wildlife, and we just wanna appreciate all the partners that we had uh, in getting this budget 
um, both the nonprofit groups, the conservation groups, the hunting groups, um, everyone who served on the BPAG, um, as well as state agencies like the Puget Sound Partnership, um, RCO. We really work together to, uh, to ensure that Department of Fish and Wildlife is strong moving forward. And I just want to take a minute to say this is good news in the middle of a, a pretty tough time. Uh, the, the director has been focused really in the last month on North of Falcon and PFMC meetings, many meet and confers throughout the last month. Um, we've also significantly ramped up our internal communication with staff as we have moved to um, mandatory telework, as we have seen the closures across the state. So our time as executives has really gone into uh, keeping our department moving forward despite an, an enormous amount of change. I want to call out our, uh, our CIO, Matt Oram, and his team. They have almost seamlessly moved 1,800 people to remote work. Um, it's, it's an impressive thing. We are now loaning out our IT team to other agencies because they are so amazing. So we continue to participate in supporting other agencies as we ourselves are, are, are being able to move forward. I have kind of two other updates. One is for those of you who track our uh, estuary restoration projects in Puget Sound, the Fur Island Restoration Project uh, reached a milestone. After 10 years of collaboration, the Skagit County Consolidated Dike Drainage and Irrigation District 22, District 22, NDFW signed the final paperwork transferring ownership and operation and maintenance responsibilities for the Fur Island Farm Estuary Restoration Project infrastructure to the district. This is a big deal. So this infrastructure consists of 5,800 feet of dike, tide gates, a seven acre drainage store pond, and a pump station. So we were able to collaboratively restore uh, the Fur Island project, and now we've handed back to the diking district for long-term maintenance and uh, all of those, the infrastructure that we, we sort of modified in order to make that project happen. Um, in addition, I know there's a lot of interest in uh, the fleet reduction proviso, which would have included 573,000 for DFW to work with the fleet to structure a Columbia River gillnet fleet reduction program and conduct a phase one bid this summer. That was vetoed last Friday. We will not be receiving that money. But despite the veto, our team is pushing forward um, with this important work. Our contractor, Kim Gordon, and the internal team have made progress this winter and spring evaluating other programs and looking at lessons learned, and identifying key components uh, for the program here in the Columbia. Next week, we'll be meeting with commercial fishing advisors um, on the 13th and with members of the Columbia River Willapa and Grace Harbor Gillnet Fleet on the 16th to share our work and get some feedback on our approach. And then finally, um, Mr. Graybill swooped me, but we are celebrating the retirement of Jim Brown. Jim Brown has 28 years of service with the state. He started as an enforcement officer. He ends his career as the Region 2 director. He has, um, I just can't say enough good things about Jim. He, he's really lived a life of service. He's given an enormous amount to this department and to the constituents, to his uh, management team. He is, uh, he's been a leader for us at EMT to just a, an incredibly um, calm, good decision maker, a collaborative person. He's transformed relationships in North Central. Um, I am so sad that he is leaving the department and the director and I are both wishing him well. He is moving on to a position at Chelan County um, so please feel free to reach out to him. He's, his last day is next Wednesday. And with that, I conclude the remarks. Any questions of uh, Deputy Wintrow? Thank you, Amy. We will now move to uh, agenda item four, uh, 2020 game setting seasons. This is a decision. Uh, it says a niece is that uh, who's handling this uh, from staff oh hey chair carpenter i screwed up a little bit okay we can back up okay sorry about that i realized that i was supposed to give a covid 19 update let me let me do that real quick okay Thank um, you. so uh you know the the commissioner spoke about uh about us moving forward and we are also moving into that into that realm um I just want to also talk about how we made these decisions and we had essentially three guideposts in making these really hard decisions about closures. Our first guidepost was the governor's order to stay at home. Our second guidepost was information from local health officials about what they needed for their communities. And our third guidepost was our authorities and the ability to execute uh, fisheries and hunting seasons in a way that was enforceable. 
we know this is really hard on our sports, sports folk. Um, we know it's hard on our staff and uh, we want to move back to normal operations as quickly as we can. So as we look forward into uh, May 4th and we think about what we can do and how we reopen our lands, um, we have essentially three, three prongs that we're doing. The first one is uh, reopening opportunity. We are working with, um, we, we're convening a group of anglers and uh, conservation groups and hunting groups next week to begin to talk about how we're gonna reopen uh, our access sites, reopen opportunity throughout the state and to do that in a way that is um, organized and um, enforceable and that has the guidance that we need to keep people safe. So we're beginning that process. We've convened an internal team to begin to look at how we're going to structure our internal work to make sure those opportunities can ramp up as, as quickly as we can. And the other piece that we're doing is we're normalizing our internal operations. So as we move forward um, in reopening the outdoors, we also need to start thinking about how we bring people back to work. Um, so the, the bringing people back to work is, is hard to know exactly how to do this because what, what we know, and, and I, I can um, ask for help here from Commissioner Thorburn, but essentially, you know, we, we recognize that this disease is going to be with us for at least a year, year and a half before there's a vaccine. And that means that as people come back to work, people will continue to get sick. And so what is our, what is our process for making sure that our staff, as they begin to interact with the public and they are doing their field work and they are sitting in offices, that we know how to manage that. Um, so we're looking to, to figure that out in the next month. We are also working very closely with State Parks, DNR, and the Governor's Office to do this in a way that is seamless across all of our state lands. So there may be ways to phase this in that make the most sense. Um, and we're just, we're just at the beginning of this process. So we, now is a good time to have guidance from the commissioners um, and to think about how commissioners might want to be engaged with us in those three efforts, the normalizing our operations, working with State Parks and DNR, and then reopening the outdoors and, and, and how we do that. Um, the final piece is that uh, we really urge our residents to continue to obey the closures um, and to keep our land safe. We have officers out in the field and they are continuing to encounter people um, walking around posted notices, going around police uh, tape that's deployed. We've, we've got anglers throughout the state that are out um, fishing and we ask you to please cease. Um, we had one officer encounter about 50 people just in one small area. So, so please, if we can all work together, we know this is hard, but if we can comply now, um, it would just keep our lands uh, safe at this moment. We do worry a lot about vandalism. All right, so I'm gonna stop there, but um, I, I did want folks to know that we're, we're now looking forward um, to figure out how to, how to undo that which we had to do at this moment. And um, I'd be happy to take any questions or, or we can talk towards the end of the meeting. Back to you, Chair Carpenter, sorry about that. Thank you, Amy. I, unless someone has uh, something they need to say now, maybe we could do a wrap up and uh, cover the content of what Amy just shared. Okay. We are now moving to item four, 2020 game setting seasons. And this is a decision. Uh, and I see we've got some PowerPoints from Anise. Yes, good morning, uh, commissioners. Uh, I'm hoping you're seeing the right screen. So this should be a, a, a slide with a bunch of wax on it. Yes, sir. Is that correct? Okay, great. Uh, yeah, good morning, commissioners, uh, deputy director. Today I'm presenting some of the hunting rules that we presented to you in April. Uh, this first presentation is a summary of uh, a, a lot of the rules the majority of which we're not recommending any changes. There are a few little changes that I will talk about, but uh, uh, we have combined all these rules together uh, to expedite this process. So some of the background, uh, I already mentioned some of this, all these rules were presented in March with the exception of waterfowl and then some of the special permit deer per uh, whack. The department does not recommend any changes uh, from what was presented at that time. Uh, of course, the, the commission does reserve the right to pull any of these rules out of this presentation and uh, amend them as they see fit. 
Uh, some of the recommended adjustments that are that differ from what we presented in April is in uh, uh, the duck season uh, WAC, uh, basically uh, changing the 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 time of the two day closure for ducks uh, that coincides with the uh, uh, youth and and uh, uh, military uh, opening. So those two day duck closures is going to be October 26th and 27th. So they get day 10 and 11. So that's just a minor change. When we went back and looked at the game management plan, it did say that we will have those closures not, not be within uh, greater than 10 days apart. So that's the reason for that one. And then the department is also recommending some adjustments to the dates of uh, uh, 16 quality special permits, 10 bucks special permits, and 15 uh, youth special permits, and 100 with disability permits. That's just mainly to align those dates either to avoid overlap with the general season or to align it with the general season. When we went back and we were doing our final review of the of the pamphlet, we realized that some of those dates were incorrect in what we presented to you. So we aligned those uh, so they would uh, fit where they needed to be. Uh, other than that, we are not recommending any changes to what we presented to you in all of those blacks. Uh, and uh, we did summarize public comment on those wax individually, and you have those in your packets. Uh, we didn't receive a lot of comments on uh, the wax that are in this presentation, uh, but all those comments are uh, that we received uh, before the March meeting, during the commission meeting, and then during the extended comment period are summarized in the summary of comment sheets that, that are in your packet. With that, uh, that's basically all of our recommended changes to all of those rules. And uh, I, I'm uh, completed that presentation and uh, would you ask for either a motion or, or an amendment. Are there any questions of Anise? Uh, can we have, does someone have a motion prepared? I'll, I'll make the motion. Thank you. Commissioner Thorburn, please. Um, before I do, um, I have a question for our attorney. Um, and that is um, the, this motion um, that's here on the screen would be to just recommend the real changes as presented. Um, would it not be um, important to list all of these rules in the motion. Um, I don't know that it is absolutely critical to list all the rules as part of your verbal motion. The slide presentation materials that everybody just viewed lists all of those rules out. Uh, and based upon the minutes that will be captured and the written materials, which are part of the record, it's, as long as it's clear that everybody's on the same page about what these rules are, I don't, again, I don't think it's technically required to list every single one of these rules out uh, verbally when you're making the motion. You can just reference the opening slide of the presentation, which, which uh, Anise has just put back up on, on everybody's screens. All right, thank you. I'll uh, move to um, uh, adopt all of the rules um, that have been presented on slide one um, as presented by staff. Commissioner Smith will second. Okay, we have a motion by Commissioner Thorburn, seconded by Commissioner Smith. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Thank you, Anish. Thank you, Commissioners. Thank you. We are now moving to um, agenda item five. This is the elk general seasons and special permits. This is, is a decision. And we have Brock somewhere. Or do we? We do now. Let's give him a moment. Okay.
Hi, Brock. We've got you promoted to panelist. Um, can you hear us? Perfect. I'm, I'm getting there. It kind of, when you turned me on, it kind of blinked out from froze a little bit. So yeah. let me Good. get my bearings and get the screen shared and then I think we can move forward. Perfect. No rush. Okay, can everybody see my screen? Yes. Okay, thank you Chair Carpenter, members of the commission, Deputy Director. Um, we're gonna review WACS 220-415-050 and 220-415-060, elk general seasons and spe elk special permits. Oh, my keyboard is not working, let's try my mouse. There we go. Okay, so the content of the presentation today is just going to be a brief statewide overview of our elk, elk herds, a summary of the minor adjustments that we presented in March, but then also in March we did not present any final recommendations for the Clockham and Yakima elk herds uh, because both of those populations are below objective and we wanted to postpone our recommendation until we had harvest estimates of harvest uh, in the two 2019 season and our survey results. And then at the end, we'll I'll field any questions that members of the commission might have. So real quick overview, we have 10 elk herds in the state. Uh, six of those elk herds are currently at objective, but we have four that are currently below objective, which includes the Clockham, Yakima, Blue Mountains, and Mount St. Helens elk herds. So a brief summary of recommendations we presented in March for elk general seasons, where we removed GMU 655, which is Anderson Island, from the list of GMUs open during modern firearm general elk seasons in Western Washington. We proposed no changes in the North Cascades, South Rainier, Olympic, Willapa Hills, Selkirk, or the Blue Mountains elk herd areas uh, for general seasons. We proposed minor adjustments in the North Rainier and Mount St. Helens elk herd areas. Both of those adjustments were associated with mitigating elk damage. And we postponed recommendations for the Clockham and Yakima elk herds until survey and harvest data were available, as I mentioned before. Moving on to elk special permits, we recommended a reduction in permits for both bulls and antlerless elk in the Blue Mountains. Again, that was related to the current uh, status of that herd being below objective. We recommended a reduction in permits for antlerless elk in Mount St. Helens for similar reasons. And we postponed the development of final re recommendations for the Clockham and Yakima elk herds. Some minor adjustments elsewhere, we added language uh, to the rule that clarifies the bag limit is one elk, even if permits are drawn in more than one category. We made no recommended adjustments uh, in the South Rainier and Selkirk elk herd areas. And we had minor adjustments that were proposed in the North Cascades, North Rainier, Olympic, and Willapa Hills elk herd areas. So moving on specifically to the Clockham elk herd, this was, this was our pr problem statement. So we've seen a steady decline in this herd. Uh, our 20 surveys in, in this spring indica indicated the herd had declined again for a, a this consecutive year. Um, we were sitting at approximately 3,700 elk. Uh, we're currently 18% below objective. When we got our 2019 harvest data, um, between 2018 and 2019, we, our average antlerless harvest in this elk herd was 327 antlerless elk. Um, that's a problem uh, based on those, those estimates and some basic population projection models that uh, we had developed. Uh, we highly anticipate that this herd would decline again in 2021 if the same level of antlerless harvest were to occur in 2020. Given the current uh, recruitment rates that we've been observing for this population. So based on that, we have recommended eliminating opportunities to harvest antlerless elk during early and late general archery seasons in GMUs 328 and 329. 
Those two GMUs represent the core area for this herd. We retained opportunities in GMUs 249, 334, and 335, uh, because those are areas where we don't really promote large numbers of elk. And we propose to offset some of the opportunity loss with special permits. And so for the, when we set our permit levels for the clockum, we did so with a harvest target of 100 antlerless elk. We would not like to exceed that in 2020 to include the elk that are harvested in damaged situations. We reduced the number of antlerless permits for modern firearm and muzzleloader hunters, and we eliminated opportunities for youth, senior, and hunters with disabilities. These changes are summarized in the, the packet, uh, your handouts, um, but they're also summarized in the table to the left. And I forgot to point out that we added some permit opportunities for the archery seasons that we had to eliminate uh, during the general season. Moving to the Yakima herd, our most recent population estimate was last spring in 2019. At that time, we were at approximately 14% below objective. We could not conduct a population estimate this year um, because the mild winter conditions uh, prevented elk from concentrating on winter range. And when that occurs, we, we, we know we're not gonna see as many elk as we would during a normal winter, so we do not fly. That being said, uh, we still had approximately 4,100 elk that came down to the feed sites and we generated estimates of calf to cow ratios from those elk that were on feed sites. And our estimated calf to cow ratio this year was 19 per 100, which is the lowest documented calf uh, ratio uh, for the Yakima herd over the last decade. So even though we were not able to generate a population estimate with a calf to cow ratio that low, um, there's a strong likelihood that this herd declined again and probably at best uh, remains stable. So similar to the Clockum, um, once we got our 2019 antlerless harvest, uh, we were able to compare that to 2018. And over those two years, we were av our average antlerless harvest was 275 antlerless elk. Uh, again, looking at a simple population projection model, um, it indicates that if we were to have that same level of antlerless harvest in 2020, we would expect this population to continue to decline. So for the Yakima, we also recommended eliminating opportunities to harvest antlerless elk during all early and late general archery seasons. Um, we are recommending to offset some of that loss opportunity with special permits. And we set permit numbers uh, with a heart in Yakima with a harvest target of 150 antlerless elk, including elk harvested in damaged situations. Uh, dissimilar to the Clockum, we were still able to retain uh, opportunities for youth, senior, and hunters with disabilities. And the permits are summarized in the table below and also in uh, your packets that you have in front of you. So public comment, uh, when we presented in March, uh, they indicated general support and understanding for the need to reduce antlerless harvest, but the consensus on how opportunities should be reduced was lacking. Uh, other themes included uh, wanting the department to address predator management and reducing tribal harvest. <clears throat> At the March commission meeting, we heard public testimony. Um, we had no testimony that was in support. We received one comment um, from representative from the Washington State Bow Hunters Association that was in opposition to the proposal uh, because they were opposed to elimination of opportunities to harvest antler antlerless elk during general archery seasons. During the extended comment period, we received one comment that expressed general support. One comment supported youth permits in GMU 371. One comment was in opposition. Um, it was the same person that testified at the March meeting. And we had one comment in opposition to changes in the master hunter season length in GMU 371. And one comment advocated for separate master hunter seasons for each weapon type in GMU 371. 
One comment advocated for allowing elk to expand into agricultural areas, and one comment advocated for antlerless permits in GMU 653, which is the White River GMU in the Northern Near Elk Herd. Mm -hmm. So with that, I'll take any questions that the commission might have at this time. Any questions from the commission? Yes, Commissioner Carpenter. Yes, Commissioner Thurber. Um, we talked about this a little bit at the Wildlife Committee meeting yesterday. We've um, been watching the Clockham and Yakima herds for several years now with uh, concern um, and responding to those in, in terms of uh, restricting opportunity. Uh, you've uh, set very specific um, a removal, harvest removal targets for each of those uh, to try to start turning the, the curve around uh, on this uh, continued decline. Um, so it seems like, um, and, and I appreciate that um, we're trying to maintain some opportunity. Um, it, it seems very important that we not exceed those targets um, if we're gonna see this turn around. Uh, in the, the uh, um, Yakima, I believe it is, um, they, uh, general season is being closed in two GMUs. That says that we'll probably push uh, hunters into those other GMUs. Now the reason for the closure and the two GMUs is that's where the elk concentrate. Um, so even if there's more hunting going on in the other GMUs, the success rate will probably be low enough to ensure that we won't exceed the targets that you've set. Yeah, so, so the two GMUs that were closed and then the other three that were remained open, that was actually in the Clockham uh, elk herd. And so um, our harvest target was primarily focused on the core herd area, which is 328 and 329. So I probably should have clarified that. So we feel comfortable uh, if, if we have higher than normal antlerless harvest in those other three GMUs, but we also don't, because um, those are areas that we try to keep elk numbers low to begin with because there's such a high potential for conflict with agricultural producers. And so we have very, we've always had those very uh, liberal seasons um, because we're okay with that level of harvest occurring there. To, to your point of concerns about um, when you close a really popular area for hunters, they're gonna go seek new areas out um, where that opportunity is still allowed. That was one of the factors that we considered when we said, do we need to close the general seasons in Yakima? So we thought there's probably a pretty good chance that we could have just closed one general archery antlerless season in the Yakima, you know, either early or late, um, and still maintained the level of harvest that we would like to see. Um, but what we were concerned about, if the hunter numbers stayed the same, but because we closed the Clockham, um, we thought those hunters would just move over to Yakima and our hunter densities would increase substantially. So that's also I would feel obligated to one of the reasons to remove the general season antlerless opportunities in Yakima as well. Any other questions of Brock or comments? Okay. Uh, this is a decision. Does someone, uh, do you have a motion language? There you are. Thank you, Brian. Larry, I'll, I'll move the motion. Okay. Commissioner Smith. I move to adopt WAX 220-415-050. And 220-415-050. 060 as presented by staff. Thank you, Commissioner Smith. Do we have a second? This is Jim Anderson. I will second. 
Okay. We have a motion by Commissioner Smith and a second by Commissioner Anderson. Do we have any further discussion? Hearing none, I'll call for the question. All those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Thank you very much, Brock. Appreciate your work. Thank you. We are now at uh, agenda item six, Cougar Rules and Decisions. Anise, I think you're back. And a quick um, comment. Um, this is Tess Wendell from Ross Strategic, who is helping facilitate some of the public comment earlier. I do notice that we have um, one hand raised um, in our attendee list. Um, if you are, I know we have a few DFW staff joining the line. Um, if you are DFW staff, if you can rename yourself um, so that you don't show up as uh, like Galaxy S10, um, that would be great. So we know who you are and we can promote you up to being a panelist if you need to say something. Other than that, for the rest of the public, um, we will be moving through a couple different agenda items um, and there will be uh, time for public comment for some of those later agenda items where we will be using the raise hand feature, but we are not taking um, hand raises right now. Thank you, Tess. Okay, Anish. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you again. Uh, next, I'll be presenting the uh, Cougar Rule presentation. Uh, again, this was presented to you in April. Uh, uh, maybe a little bit of preface. I know we, we heard a lot of comment and I don't want that to go uh, un, unchecked, I guess. There's many facets to cougar management uh, and they're all interconnected. There's recreational hunting, there's public safety and livestock deprivation, and there's also an at-risk ungulates. And then the options we presented are intended to allow for additional recreational harvest in areas where densities could be higher based on harvest statistics and conflict information. Uh, we have heard the public comments and concerns regarding the other important facets, uh, and we are addressing them uh, as follows, and then probably even additionally as, as we move forward. Uh, we will continue to respond to these calls uh, for public safety and livestock depredation. Uh, in the 2018-19 season, we removed 101 cougars in response to public safety and livestock depredation. So we take that very seriously and are uh, continuing to do so. We, we also have recommended uh, beginning the revision process for WAC 220 440 030, which is the public safety cougar removal WAC. This WAC does allow for uh, additional harvest of cougars using hunters and including hound hunting uh, to, to resolve some of these conflicts. Uh, and then hopefully if by revising this WAC using an external working group to help us, uh, we would come up with some new tools to reduce cougar conflict in both in all rural, urban and suburban communities. Uh, and then as far as the at-risk ungulates uh, are concerned, we, we will continue uh, assessing the at-risk ungulate populations and consider better control on these herds uh, where predation appears to be a limiting factor. Uh, Brock uh, has presented some of that information at the last commission meeting and we, will, we are looking uh, seriously at some of these populations and looking at possible predator control where, where we, we think it is a limiting factor. So I wanted to make sure that people understand that it's multifaceted, we're addressing some of these other things and there are always more things we can do and we're open to additional suggestions on some of those things. But the recommendations before you today are merely to deal with recreational hunting of cougars and re really not intended to uh, address directly the, the conflict issues. With that, I'll move into the, uh, the recommendations. Uh, again, these were presented to you in, in uh, March, so I won't belabor them. We're not recommending any season date changes, so the change dates will remain the same. September 1st to 31st is the early season. January 1st to April 30th is the late season for, for all these options. And then, so option one is basically status quo with one caveat that we use uh, the, the median instead of the density to calculate uh, the uh, population estimate. Uh, 
Uh, and then uh, the second recommended option is basically the same as the first option, but we only count uh, we we only count adult cougars. So subadult cougars do not count into the density, nor do they count into the uh, the harvest when they are harvested during the season. And this this one has a potential for a roughly 30% increase in harvest, uh, 73 cougars. That's usually what we uh, end up harvesting as subadults uh, in the current frame, framework. Option three is basically to adjust the guideline upwards for 19 units that exceeded the guideline uh, by December 31st, at least once in the past five years. Uh, the new guidelines is based on the highest harvest in the past five years. Uh, in this option, there's an assumption that density is higher in these areas. Uh, in two PMUs, as I mentioned before, we adjusted that down uh, to be a more realistic uh, number. Uh, these guidelines include both adults and subadults under this option. And then option four is uh, much like option three, where we uh, adjust uh, the guidelines upward in those 19 units but it would also would not count subadults into the harvest. So you would only be counting adult cougars uh, into the guideline when you're looking at closures. And then uh, again, I showed you this table before, it just goes through the different options and shows uh, what the uh, potential for increased harvest is under each of these options. And then what the potential increase or decrease in guideline is under all of these options. Uh, and obviously option one is closest to what we currently have and option four uh, increases harvest uh, quite a bit from what we currently have. So uh, as far as public comment, oh, we do, we do have some recommended uh, adjustments. As we looked at the rule, as it was written, we realized a couple of things were, were uh, uh, missing. Uh, the, so the, the recommended change is that all cougars of the appropriate age class killed by licensed hunters during the early and late seasons shall be counted towards the guideline. The rationale for that is the current rule language does not allow for options that consider only counting specific age classes towards the guideline. This change would allow for that. And then the current uh, rule language also includes cougars that are harvested through our public safety removal rule, 220, 440, 030. Uh, and then it is, it's really not appropriate to count cougars harvested under this rule because those removals are intended to deal with public safety. So it kind of uh, decouples those two rules. One is dealing with public safety. The other one is dealing with recreational harvest. Uh, we also intend at some point, as I mentioned, to modify this other rule, the public safety rule. And it's unclear how potential changes in that will affect the current rule. So this would keep them separate and, and make it uh, easier to amend one rule without having to amend the, the other rule. So those are recommended changes that we have uh, put forward toward, uh, in your packet as well. So now going to the summary of comments, uh, these, are the, these are the comments that came to us before the, the commission meeting and we've already uh, gone through them, basically 177 online comments, 52% uh, generally agreed, 34% generally disagreed and 14% of the responses were neutral. We did receive 555 emails and one letter. This is all prior. Uh, 532 were form letter opposing predator uh, hunting. Eight were in favor of at least one of the proposed options and the rest were in basically three camps. There were those that wanted no cougar hunting, those that wanted more cougar hunting, and then some wanted no change to the guidelines. Uh, since that, uh, since that, we obviously have had the commission meeting where we had a lot of comment. We also extended the public comment period where we did receive quite a few comments, and the majority of them actually were in, uh, in uh, preferred option one, which is kind of the no change option. And two people advocated for more cougar hunting generally. We also received. Uh, a letter from the Humane Society with a survey that they had done uh, that asked people how they felt about predator hunting. And I think you, you also received that and, and you should have that survey as well. I wanna, I wanna uh, state that we received lots of letters from lots of the 
uh, organizations around around the state, including the Mountain Lion Foundation, uh, Conservation Northwest, uh, CBD, uh, Humane Society. So all of these are in, in the files and, and I wanted to make sure that people knew that we have read through those and have considered all of that. And with that, you know, I would uh, uh, take any questions and would uh, uh, look for uh, a motion uh, of one of the, the options or, or a modification of any of the options. Any questions from the commission? Uh, Anisha, I, I have one question. This is Larry Carpenter. Um, I recall back in Kennewick that uh, there was a discussion brought forward by some stakeholders in region one about consideration for a pilot project similar to what goes on in the Idaho panhandle. Did you receive something um, on that from that region or uh, and or if so, did you uh, uh, give it any uh, consideration? Yeah, uh, we, we received we received that early on in the process uh, and we did consider it. It just does not does not fall within what we can do under the game management plan that that scenario basically sets a minimum threshold for harvest and you wouldn't consider it uh, uh, a biological issue unless you met that minimum threshold. So basically, I think the number they used was 37. So as long as you're harvesting above 37 cougars, you're fine. But, as, but if you dip below that 37, then you are maybe have a biological issue. Uh, the, the current framework in our game management plan really doesn't allow for that type of uh, harvest management, uh, a minimum-based harvest management. Uh, and so that's why we didn't uh, recommend it as a recommendation. Uh, even as a pilot, I think it would be uh, an excessive amount of harvest. Well, then I just wanted to confirm that you, you did get something and did consider it. I, your, your recommendation, I guess, is uh, understandable. The, uh, has, let me ask one other question, then I'll let any others that want to comment. I, the, the one item that sticks in, in the back of my mind that I just worry about is uh, uh, and the public safety aspect of it. Has there been any, any new news, uh, any new uh, problems with uh, uh, pets or livestock close to residences recently, or has, has things been quiet since our Kennewick meeting? It's really difficult for me to say, uh, you know, I'll, a lot of that happens locally, and I, I haven't heard of major things that are going. I'm sure there are still concerns and still cougars uh, in areas maybe where they shouldn't be. But uh, to, to speak to specifics, I really couldn't speak to any specifics that I've heard of. Okay, thank you very much. For... Commissioner Carpenter? Yes, Commissioner if I could, um, We did talk about that um, at our meeting with Region 1 last week, and um, it, the captain presented us with um, very uh, specific statistics and, and the answer is yes, they have responded to um, several public safety calls since Kennewick. Um, he, he talked about some that had just been within the recent days of our meeting. Thank you, Commissioner Thorpe. Okay, uh, any other questions from other commissioners? So if there are no other questions, um, I, will, um, I will make a motion that comes uh, as a non-unanimous motion from the, um, uh, from the Wildlife Committee. Uh, after I make the motion, if there's a second, uh, I'd like to comment on the motion. Um, and then after we um, act on our decision, um, I'd like again to return to uh, a little bit more discussion about some recommendations from the Wildlife Committee regarding cougar management, both public safety and, and harvest. Okay, please continue, Commissioner Thorburn. So um, the uh, uh, motion is uh, to 
uh, adopt um, option four. Is there a second? And I'll comment on it. This is Commissioner Lindell, I'll second. Okay, we have a motion by Commissioner Thorburn and a second by Commissioner Linville. Um, can, may I ask that um, option four be put on the screen? So um, option four, um, calculates the assumed density, uh, as it says, on adult cougar um, based on uh, both uh, the, uh, the statewide density and um, additional data, uh, which is um, that it, it, it involves the um, Puma management units uh, that have reached or exceeded uh, the gui guideline during the harvest season uh, within the, what is it, past five years. So um, uh, in, in Washington, I'm actually gonna turn my camera off because it says that I'm having trouble with my internet connection, so I'll just be speaking. Um, so uh, within, uh, uh, or uh, our current uh, cougar management, uh, cougar harvest management, uh, establishes um, a guideline uh, that uh, whose purpose is to maintain a stable adult cougar population. Um, it's based on um, a cougar density in that puma management unit and um, a, a harvest guideline of uh, 12 to 16 percent, which um, comprises uh, the, the, replace, the uh, anticipated cougar replacement uh, so that we're maintaining a stable population. Um, what option four does is um, I make probably a better uh, density estimate in um, uh, units that are likely to have um, higher densities. Um, this was actually referred to in um, the testimony by the Humane Society this morning that we have, we obviously have um, variable densities um, in our cougar habitat. Um, and uh, our current practice has been to just sort of look at a statewide average to establish those densities. So it's the feeling of at least the uh, majority of the wildlife committee that um, we're um, carrying out our um, current harvest guidance um, by uh, uh, um, recognizing that there's a variable density in uh, food um, I also want to uh, note that uh, well-regulated harvest, I also uh, listening to the testimony this morning, well-regulated harvest um, is not an issue in the decline of biodiversity. Um, uh, hunting has always been part of um, conservation, a wildlife conservation in um, the United States, uh, granted, uh, one time there was market hunting and it certainly contributed to biodiversity decline. Um, but since uh, hunting has become uh, well-regulated um, and well-enforced, um, hunting, uh, it does not um, interfere with uh, biodiversity conservation. Um, so saying that, um, that's uh, a little bit of the reasoning that uh, goes uh, behind the majority recommendation uh, and, and the motion that I put forward um, to the commission to adopt option four. Any other uh, comments from the commission? Mr. Chairman. Commissioner McIsaac. Uh, with regard to the option four part that sets an upper bound on, on the, uh, the new quotas, if you want to use that phrase, I guess, for each game management unit, uh, 
uh, could you explain a little bit more either the wildlife committee folks or, or staff on uh, what the chances are of that guideline being exceeded? Uh, it seemed to have been based on some sort of uh, other studies elsewhere, but on the other hand, it seems like we do have a lot of cougars in certain areas, and if it's based on other densities somewhere else, it still could not be reflective of the true density. So is it likely that these uh, upper bounds will be hit and the hunting season would be closed early? Would you, would you like me to answer that? Yeah, maybe that is a, maybe that is a, a question for our biologists. Thank you. Yeah. So, so there is a likelihood that those upper bounds would be hit, but it's, it is unlikely. So what we did is we looked at the highest harvest in the past five years, and that's where we set the guideline, with the exception of only two units, which exceeded by a long way that, uh, that what we see in the literature. And so uh, for most units, I don't think we will exceed them at least one out of five years, but, but there is that potential. But we also wanted to stay within uh, the realm of possibility of cougar densities. And that's why those two units, we actually backed them off a little bit. Uh, and because they did have extreme years, but in general, uh, the harvest wasn't as high as those highest years. So there are always gonna be anomalies in, in any data set. But uh the, the intent was to keep it open most years thank you i'd like to recognize commissioner baker am i on you are okay so um i'm not gonna make a long statement today but i was the one person in the wildlife committee that will not be voting for option four um, the reason that I won't be voting for option four is that I don't see that it will address either of the problems that have been raised as rationales for increasing cougar harvest in the Northeast. Those were the um, diminution of the ungulates in the area and public safety. It's been stated clearly today that um, <clears throat> harvest within the game management plan probably won't have any effect on public safety. I think that almost all of the, um, the heartfelt and emotional testimony that we have received both in, on the east side, both from Spokane and then most recently Kennewick has been on that subject. My question has repeatedly been how we can quantify what our action, what result our actions will have on the behavior of the cougars. And um, harvesting more cougars, it's not going to have a positive effect. All of the science that I've read said that there's a possibility it will have a detrimental effect. And for that reason, I can't um, support it. What I'd like to see us do instead is, is really take on this public safety issue hard. Um, I, like all of us, was much moved by the testimony that we've heard. Um, and I, I would like to localize the response as much as possible. I think that the fact that the legislature just passed the hound hunting training bill exhibits some will of the people of this state to make allowances that would be able to address these issues even in response to the initiative that passed that prohibited hound hunting and trapping and uh, baiting all of that many years ago. I think what we have seen in the behavior of the cougars is that they've possibly become habituated. I'm not a wildlife biologist but it seems to me that they are losing their fear of people and that if we allow hound hunting of the animals that are causing problems, and I wanna make it real clear, that's who I'm talking about. An animal that we would probably, Fish and Wildlife would go out and kill if a person with a, a set of well-trained hounds, uh, if not a person with a, with a set of hounds. I'd like for us to focus very carefully and very intensely on that problem. I'd like to get the people together that you all have talked about repeatedly today in uh, district or in region one to 
on all sides of this issue to figure out how we can deal with it. And I'm not talking about a multi-year process and um, figure out why those cats are coming around. There's many, I've heard many uh, suggestions about why they're coming down. And I don't know if any of them are true, but uh, I do know that the increase in the number of depredations that have occurred and the re our responses shows that we've got a big problem. And I don't really see any reason to vote for something that isn't gonna solve that problem. So that's all I have to say today. Commissioner Anderson. Uh, yes, uh, thank you. Um, first off, I wanna uh, thank folks that have put together the, um, the information. It's, it's been uh, helpful. Um, uh, staff has uh, tried to put together information that we could look at um, and help make some uh, decisions. You know, I think unfortunately there isn't a as bright of a line in science as uh, many of us would like to assign it uh, uh, or define it as such. Um, whether it's in fisheries or wildlife, it, it, there are many uh, different elements involved in the. Uh, uh, the science is um, not always as, as clear as we would like. Uh, I believe that um, uh, we are uh, within the, uh, consistent with the game management plan with, with uh, these options and in particular with option four. Uh, I do think that um, uh, we uh, have this as a, uh, the game management um, units and, um, our hunts as tools, um, and that it uh, it isn't all in the in the northeast uh, that we're dealing with, but rather um, uh, statewide. So, a localized response, I think, is is good. I'm I'm all in favor of making a pivot um, uh, after we make some decisions here, and and move on with uh, more discussion about. Uh, cougars in the Northeast. Any other uh, commissioners uh, want to make comments before I call for the question? Commissioner Linville? I um, would like to clarify that I um, support this, the option for, but not because I think that it's going to be any kind of solution towards public safety. Um, I'm comfortable with this option. I believe it stays within our bounds under the game management plan. And I would also like to say that I support um, Commissioner Baker's um, commitment, absolute commitment to short term, like near future actual work on the public safety issue around um, cougars. And I'm certainly, um, I, I I understand her opposition to option four, um, but I want to be clear that, that I'm not in support of it because I think it, it changes anything around the public safety um, issue. I don't. Um, and I hope that um, we will also, I don't know if Commissioner Thorburn has something prepared, but um, I would also like to see us um, uh, make a clear commitment to um, the public safety issue on this. Thank you, Commissioner Linville. Uh, this is Commissioner Graybill. Commissioner Graybill. Um, I also, I, I, I'm not going to support uh, option four uh, at this time. Um, I agree with uh, Commissioner Baker in respect to uh, the fact that I, in my opinion, I think we are trying to appease uh, the residents of that region um, and deviating from available science uh, to do that. Um, I appreciate Commissioner Linville's comments um, in that I think she recognizes that this isn't going to be the solution for public safety. Um, and although I appreciate the concern um, and all the testimony that we, we have received from that region, I think it's critical that we abide by uh, the best available science and not uh, deviate uh, just for the sake of trying to respond to those issues. 
Thank you, Chair. Uh, you. Chair Carpenter. Commissioner Smith. Yes, for the, for the reasons put forward by my colleagues, Commissioner Baker and Commissioner Graybill, I won't reiterate what they said, but I will not be supporting uh, the recommendation uh, for the reasons that have already been put forward. Okay. This is, um, this is Commissioner Kehoe. Commissioner Kehoe. Um, so yeah, thank you. And um, I appreciate uh, the, the recommendation from the, uh, from the committee. Also appreciate uh, Commissioner Baker's comments. Um, I mean, I, to me, I think we should be ramping up um, the public safety aspect uh, using um, uh, using hounds where appropriate. I, I mean, I, I think that's, I assume that's gonna go forward uh, uh, regardless of, uh, of what we do here with respect to uh, uh, this motion. But so maybe I have a question for the, the committee. Um, you know, it seems option four and option three are very close. Um, uh, so I just wanting to get uh, kind of the, the committee's uh, rationale for going for, for, uh, for number four as opposed to uh, option three. Um. <clears throat> Commissioner, uh, Commissioner Carpenter, if I could um, respond. I, yeah, I, I want to thank um, Commissioner Linville for um, uh, pointing out that I, I was prepared to make remarks um, after this motion, but I did forget to mention that uh, we, we recognize that um, this um, recommendation is about um, hunting opportunity and not about the public safety issues. Those are two prongs to cougar management that are, are very separated in our current approach to cougar management. Um, and uh, uh, we discussed that at great length. Um, nonetheless, I, as I tried to make clear, uh, we feel like option four uh, actually best represents uh, what is the current policy in our in the cougar chapter of the um, of the uh, game management plan because um, it improves on the density estimate uh, that is used um, for uh, calculating the guideline um, and for that reason um, since we do have uh, cougar hunting in the state, uh, we uh, saw it as an opportunity to, um, to, to correct uh, opportunity. Um, so that, that, was, uh, that was very clear in my discussion. I'm sorry I didn't bring it up when I made the motion, but uh, do, I, I do wanna make some additional comments after we've made this a decision. The reason that we select option four over option three in answer to uh, Commissioner Kehoe um, is that uh, the, the guideline is, is to hold adult cougars stable. Um, so, so uh, again, we think it more reflects um, what our current our uh, harvest policy is in the uh, game management plan. The carpenter, may I add on to Commissioner Thorburn? Please, Commissioner Linville. Uh, and another portion of this that we need to make clear is we are being asked to follow the best available science. And the fact of the matter is this still stays within the 12 to 18 percent of the population that I think virtually all the other states use because that's what best available science came to. So this, this option still stays within that parameter that is science-based. This is not going out on a big, you know, a totally different limb. And so I just want to make that clear as well. And then another portion of this discussion that I don't know if we need to have now, but just to call it out is that um, that we've been talking about is it's not just public safety and it's not just hunting, 
that are the two things that come up in this discussion, um, ungulate survival also comes into our discussion as well. And um, so as you can kind of imagine, those are three big cans of worms. Um, but I just wanted to call that out that the ungulate survival is also in our thinking when we're making these decisions. Thank you, Commissioner Lingo. Uh, Commissioner McIsaac. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I appreciate all the discussion on both sides of this. Uh, and at this point, I'm inclined to support the Wildlife Committee's majority motion. Uh, I do want to hear a lot more when we're done with the hunting season business about uh, what can be done on the human safety, the non-hunting human safety side of things. But um, when I look at just the, the hunting part of it, I think what we, we have learned from the staff is that hunting seasons alone are not gonna make a big difference on hunting season. So separate out uh, increased hunting as a reason to address that problem. Um, but so should the cougar regulations uh, be liberalized or not gets down to a question, do we think our density uh, estimates for cougar are too low? Are they right? Are they wrong? And we heard uh, from uh, previous commission meetings that the number of lethal remover, removals over the last few years has really gone up from 20 to 30 to 60 or 80 to over 100. And uh, the trend on the take of cougars is in an upward direction. And the uh, number of calls for enforcement folks has doubled recently. And there's all of these indicators that maybe our statewide density business is not right. And uh, if you uh, set fishing quotas on the basis of how many fish there are, uh, it's a similar situation in hunting. That's what we just went through on elk and deer. And so that's the part of, that is swaying me on this matter of should the hunting seasons be liberalized or not gets down to the scientific uncertainty on our previous way of setting seasons. And, uh, you know, I'm interested to hear what everybody has to say, but I'm inclined to support the motion. Thank you, Commissioner McIsaac. Uh, Commissioner Baker. Thank you. You know, I, it is obvious. This is a, this is a terribly, terribly difficult issue. And I want to say that um, I respect each one of us and, and our ability to, to talk about it um, you know, w as reasonable minds. Also, thanks to the staff. This is, the reason that we're talking about this at all is because it's been raised as a problem. And the problem has been uh, discussed in terms of ungulates and public safety. My feeling is if we wanna um, change the density models and provide more recreational opportunity, at least with the density models, that makes all kinds of sense. I, I, I just think it strains uh, logic to, to believe that there are as many cougars uh, even averaged in my county as there are in the Northeast. But this is what we're stuck with and this is what the game management plan says. And I believe that, that the recreational opportunity issue, if that's all we're talking about, should be dealt with when we change the game management plan and we do a SEPA and we actually don't average densities over the state. Uh, to me, that makes no sense, but it's what we have. So then if we take that aside and, and this, this conversation surprises me because we aren't, we're acknowledging that we aren't going to address the problem by increasing hunting. So then we're left with ungulates and public safety. I've already said my piece on public safety Ungulates is a whole different issue. Um, the tab right before this, if we had books, would have been elk. And we've got elk crashing in four or five of our herds. Two of them are in central Washington, and we don't know why they're crashing. But it's probably not predators, and if it is, it's probably, but uh, I'd like to know. So I don't think that we can just say we're, we're mixing our problems here. We're saying there's probably more cougars because there's usually over hunt, uh, over, we hunt over the allowances. So that means that we've got more cougars. So if we go kill more cougars, maybe they won't, maybe their behavior will change and they will not come down and 
be habituated and bother people. Um, <laughs> the logic of that doesn't work. Uh, so that's what I think. If, if the only reason we're doing this is to increase recreational opportunity, I've got no problem with doing that. I do have a problem with doing that as a response to a problem and outside of the game management plan, which by the way, we had a long discussion about that in the wildlife committee, whether we take it outside, take cougars outside and possibly expedite that. I'd like to say right now that I'd be in favor of doing that given all these um, issues that we're having. We need to have our scientists give us options that will solve the problems we're trying to solve. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Baker. Mr. Carpenter, if I may. Uh, Anish, please. There were, there were a couple of points that were made that probably need to be uh, corrected. So uh, I think uh, Commissioner Lindo uh, alluded to the 18%. It's actually 16%. Just, it's 12 to 16. And then as far as the density, the statewide density that we use is not in the game management plan. We chose to do that uh, because we, we don't have densities everywhere. And so that if, if a specific density needs to be applied to a specific place, we would have to have information from that specific place. And we don't have that information statewide. That's why we chose a, a statewide density. And, and we could, under the existing game management plan, have different densities in different places. So I don't want our people to be thinking that the, uh, that the density is tied to the game management plan. If people want different densities in different places, we would have to have that information from those places and we can work that under our current existing game management plan. Um, I guess I have an observation and, and uh, I'm very respectful of uh, the comments made by all the commissioners. I mean, some really heartfelt deep dives on trying to figure out uh, what we should do, what our responsibilities are as policy makers. And, uh, providing guidance to the department. I guess what uh, I guess what bothers me a little bit is no matter what we do, it doesn't appear to me uh, that we have a big enough Band-Aid to fix this. Uh, we have a little Band-Aid. We can take option one, two, three, or four. And we really haven't solved anything as far as the public safety aspect of it, which is my biggest worry. And also the ung ungulate population, which is a major contributor to other problems that we have. Uh, so I guess I don't have a recommendation, but I just, I, I just feel like whatever we do is uh, not really going to move in a direction to solve anything. And I, uh, I'm worried by that. Um, uh, Mr. Chair, I, I have another question for staff. Commissioner Keogh. Yeah, thanks. So, um, Anise, if, uh, you know, if we do go forward, uh, uh, if, if motion if option four is, is uh, passed by the commission, um, can we use, uh, um, you know, the data uh, with an increase uh, in um, uh, allowance for, uh, for, for hunting take, can we use that data then to get, her, get a better uh, picture about densities in these areas, these 19 areas? So yeah, I mean, there, there are methods to use harvest data to try to reconstruct populations. Uh, we could go that approach uh, because we have age data as well. Uh, so yeah, there is a potential for us to use a different metric to figure out what densities are. We don't currently do that, but there is a potential for us to do uh, that very thing. It's, it's still kind of a, uh, an emerging science, at least when it comes to cougars. It's been done for other species in the past, but uh, I guess there is that potential. It's just not the way we currently do. We do look at the harvest data and look at ages and, and uh, percentage female and all of that. And, and all the data uh, points to their not, the population is behaving similarly everywhere in the state. So it doesn't show any differences in one part versus the other when you look at that information. So. Uh, it's, it's not, a, I guess it's not an easy yes or no answer. I apologize for that. Um, I, I appreciate that. I mean, I think if it is a tool though, I, and you did, 
I mean, I think we recognize and, and uh, Commissioner Baker brought it up is that we have different, different densities throughout the state. So if there's a way, if there's a tool that we could use to uh, improve our understanding about uh, cooler densities in specific areas, to me, I think, it, and then still uh, stay within the conservation uh, uh, limits and, and ranges, it seems to me that that would be, a, 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 we could use this data um, in a positive way. So, I mean, and I, I appreciate everybody's comments. I know this is a tough issue, but uh, I'm prepared to vote in favor of, uh, of the motion adopting option four. Thank you. Okay, are there any other comments uh, or discussion points from the commission? Hearing none, I'll call for the question. Uh, uh, the motion, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same. No. Aye. No. We had two no's. Commissioner Baker? No, three no's. I'm sorry? I thought it was three. Do you want to go ahead and raise your hand if you voted no? At the bottom of the participant list. Oh, okay, the bottom. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. <laughs> sorry. And I, well, see... I don't know. I, can, I can't see everybody, so okay. I don't know. Okay, so I see one vote from David Graybill and one from Barbara Baker. Is there anyone else um, yeah, that voted I'm, no? We're, oh, I see. Wait a sec, there. Okay. You got mine? Yes, Brad Smith, Barbara, and Dave. Thank you. Okay. Okay, motion carries. Thank you all. Commissioner Thorburn, did you want to have some further discussion? <coughs> I just had all my power go out here. I'm going to have to go see what that is here as soon as we get done and get to the break. So, Commissioner Thorburn, did you want to have some follow up discussion? Uh, Kim, you're muted. Yes, I muted. I have trouble toggling uh, all these buttons. Uh, so, uh, as, as our discussion uh, today uh, among the commissioners uh, has acknowledged, uh, we have um, in the Wildlife Committee been um, discussing these very real concerns about public safety um, that uh, have been brought to us most intensively from uh, Northeastern Washington, but we've also heard them from other areas, as Commissioner Anderson has said, um, and uh, the need, the urgent need um, to move forward. Um, we've been having these discussions with staff. Anis, in his presentation, um, already raised um, some of the areas of work that's going on to deal with these um, and uh, that can be um, currently managed um, under the game, uh, the Cougar chapter of the game management plan. Um, we uh, also recognize that, that there are other tools and options that may be restricted by the current chapter um, in the game management plan. So we've talked about the, the game management plan um, is uh, going to be revised, um, but that uh, process is, is a ways out, um, and we feel that there's uh, more urgency to this issue than waiting for the full revision of the game management plan. The game management plan is, um, is developed under SEPA, so it's a um, process that takes time and staff time. Uh, and uh, we are concerned that the date for the revision of the full plan doesn't meet the urgency uh, of being able to evaluate all of the tools um, and options uh, to improve public safety um, uh, that, that are before us. One example, uh, Commissioner Carpenter, or Chair Carpenter, you raised this morning uh, 
the uh, Northeast Wildlife Group has provided us with this um, uh, idea for a different um, hunt, hunt method of hunting. Um, it, it's a method that, I, I, I that the, um, Commissioner Kehoe is looking for. We cannot, um, as Anise explained, really uh, seriously evaluate that uh, under our current um, Cougar chapter in the, the game management plan. So uh, we've actually um, talked about the possibility of pulling out the Cougar chapter of the game management plan in advance of the uh, full revisions of the uh, game management plan uh, and possibly start the SEPA process on that chapter alone to allow us to evaluate in a broad sense uh, the tools to deal with this public safety issue, including the possibility of um, using harvest um, uh, for public safety purposes. Right now, as I mentioned, there are really two prongs uh, to approaching cougar management. Um, under our game management plan. Uh, there's the public safety prong and there's the, um, the harvest prong. Um, so uh, we had a long discussion with staff yesterday um, regarding resources and the possibility of doing this. We all agree about the urgency of moving forward and are really pleased that staff is um, moving forward on a lot of initiatives that we can move forward on under our current policy. Um, but uh, we're, we're really thinking that we may need to do more than that. So uh, staff uh, has committed to bringing to us um, a, a menu of options, um, including looking at the resources uh, so that uh, uh, we probably will be coming back to the commission uh, in the near future with a recommendation um, about uh, uh, various steps that we'll be taking um, to, to really keep going on this urgent issue. Uh, so with that summary, um, I'll just ask if any of my um, any of the members of that the wildlife committee also want to be. Yeah, so I, I'm kind of wondering if this would be an appropriate time and, and um, this is a procedural question, I guess. Um, could we um, make a motion to um, set the timing for when the staff will get back to us on um, you know, so that people, so that people can sort of predict like the, the timing on, on their list of options that we can work on or um, just to add some clarity and predictability to this. And that, that's a question. Is that something we should do right now or can do right now? Uh, I, I think that we, okay, yeah, sorry. I'm sorry, this is Jim Anderson. Go ahead, Commissioner Anderson. Um, I guess, um, responding to Commissioner Linville, I, I think that um, if we have a clear enough uh, sense of purpose with this conversation, convey that to the staff, um, I would feel comf more comfortable with um, establishing some time frames based on uh, a quick turn around from the staff and report back uh, to the commission so that we were um, endorsing and, and uh, approving uh, dates and timeframes that kind of were most considered rather than set some arbitrary uh, date. But I wouldn't want to delay this uh, beyond say uh, a report coming back to us in the very near future. Does that make sense? Commissioner Carpenter. Uh, Amy. Um, so I, I thought maybe I could weigh in. Um, it would be helpful to have some guidance from the commissioners. Um, I think uh, to satisfy what uh, Commissioner Linville and Commissioner Anderson are both saying, what might be most useful is for us to lay out the scope and timeline for the public safety elements and what, uh, what our recommendation is for 
changes to the game management plan, or I don't think we can do that because we've got to go through SEPA, but we can begin to consider the game management plan and what it would mean in terms of timing to look at that section. Um, if we're going to uh, change the game management plan for the 2021 season, we'll need to begin that work uh, immediately is my understanding. So, uh, so our, our intention is um, with guidance from the commission, we would, we would move fairly quickly to get you um, a plan of action. Okay, uh, Commissioner Baker and then Commissioner McIsaac. Um, brief comment, just in response to Commissioner Lemville's request. First off, I appreciate the request. Secondly, we pretty much have a, at least a operating policy not to make motions and decide them uh, in one meeting without any public uh, input. I think that we can talk about this at the next wildlife committee meeting. It sounds to me like, you know, our, our requests have been pretty well uh, received and uh, Amy's, Amy's response is that they will get back to us. Uh, so I, th I think we should just um, let this one go for now. Thank you, Commissioner Baker. Commissioner McIsaac? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, so I appreciate this uh, discussion about what's next and uh, maybe a question for a couple people about what is meant by being done reasonably expeditiously. So we have this matter of hound training protocols that may reintroduce fear of humans or may gain some new scientific evidence on densities. I'm not sure if that's going to be a big non-hunting safety solution, but that was mentioned anyway. And maybe that's expeditious, but I don't know if that would solve the problem or not. In the staff presentation, there was a reference to revising a WAC. I don't know if that's more expeditious than reopening the uh, Cougar chapter of the game management plan. So if we're looking for some staff presentation real soon, uh, which of those options uh, can be done most expeditiously is, a, is something to think about. I might also back up and say thanks to the staff for uh, over the course of the past year uh, putting into fast motion what just happened. At least it was a consideration. We learned something in there about what hunting can and cannot do, but it was a response to the public from Spokane a year ago, and, and, and I hope the folks out there appreciate that. When we do look at what's next, um, I think it'd be good to... Uh, uh, talk a little bit about co-manager collaboration. We heard some testimony from uh, the Macaw tribe cougar biologist. I think we heard from the Colville tribe biologist on cougar business at one of our hearings. And uh, so when you start to talk about an expeditious process, uh, to the extent that uh, our staff, who is, I presume, going to have its highest priority on this three-year um, uh, triennial hunting review, that uh, that maybe they could use some help. And so maybe uh, uh, the co-manager thing could be help as well as just the natural uh, consideration that all of this affects them in some manner. And then I would throw in, in terms of expeditious, uh, the idea of putting a contractor involved here as well. So when you talk about the word SEPA, that doesn't sound expeditious to me. Um, so, but I don't know, I guess maybe go back to uh, Commissioner Baker, who said, we got to this stage of the discussion, she had an idea for an expeditious process. And uh, maybe I'd uh, ask to explain a little bit more what you had in mind when you meant that. Uh, is that a question for me? Yes, yes. Okay, to go, Chair Carpenter. Yes, go ahead, Commissioner Baker. Sorry. The, um, my idea isn't my idea. It's an idea that's uh, not only happened before, but it sounds to me in listening to Commissioner Thorburn and Commissioner Linville that they're already talking about it. Um, this is an extremely polarized issue. You know, you all heard today's testimony, which completely surprised me from the public, but it's also uh, happened before. You, you all know that about 20 or 25 years ago, cougar management in the same area came to an absolute head. And what happened when, when the passions got 
completely crazy there is that the citizens of that area got together the um, fish and wildlife, the conservationists, the, the residents and the uh, agency people and uh, figured out a solution that worked for a very long time. So I'm suggesting that that, that happen and happen soon. Um, I'd love to be involved in it, but it's not my area. But and use as one of those um, the tools that they now have available to them that the legislature has enough um, buy-in and faith in in their ability to use this wisely that they just passed a hound hunting training bill for the purpose of having citizens armed with um, to be able to help us. I mean, it seems to me like that's just a gift to us, especially to those of us like me who support the initiative for just regular hunting seasons. Just one more point on that. Um, just yesterday, we all got from in our news clips a um, an, an, an article written in the Spokane paper by Andy Wolgamont making the point that, um, that trained volunteers are needed to help remove goats from uh, the Olympic National Park. Well, I think we could do something like that to deal with the public safety issue in uh, the Northeast that would go a long way to having those communities feeling like they were listened to and participate in the problem. So that's, um, that's, that's all I was talking about. And I don't think it would have to take years to um, put something like that in place. I think the tools are there. Thank you, Commissioner Baker. Amy, uh, I'm gonna move to wrap up this agenda item. Uh, I think you've heard a lot of passion and concern uh, regarding the cougar issues. I don't need to dwell on it. Uh, we look forward to hearing back. Um, thanks to all my colleagues for the heartfelt uh, thoughts on this. We are going to take a short break. Now we're a little behind. Uh, it is 11:18. Uh, Let's go to 11:35, and then we're going to take up number seven, hydraulic project implementing bill 1579. This is a briefing and public hearing. So back at 11.35, please.
How are things, Larry? You're muted. You're muted. There we go. How's John handling all this? Um, he's getting a little bit uh, tired of it. Uh, we're going to go back and open up things next week a little bit, let him go with a caregiver. He's getting a little mad at his mother and I, but that's understandable. I've seen you do that too. <laughs> I thought I lost power because I'm in one of the guest bedrooms and, and I went running around to see what was going on. I got on Puget Sound Energy, but uh, I just had a uh, overhead bulb to burn out. So we're back in order again now. <laughs> <laughs> That's good to hear. <laughs> well, I feel like I'm in the dark every day. So. Who are you calling burned out? <laughs> uh, I think we're about ready to go here in just a minute. Well, do we have a quorum? If so, we could get started, right? Yes, we do. Tess, are you ladies ready to go? Uh, Chair, Chair, Chair Carpenter, you, you did uh, continue to 11.35, so I'd recommend you wait two more minutes and not start two minutes early. My computer says 11.36, Joe. Oh, mine says 11.33. Well, then I'll wait. <laughs> Are yeah. you three minutes when your light went out? Well, I, well, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't power. I had a ball burnt out, so I got that done. We're back alive again. Uh, just as a question, on, on, uh, Joe Panesco brought up some of the oh, uh, in interference, you want to say? Uh, I wondered if that is people who are not muted reverberating back out or not, or if that's just something else. And I don't know if Tess knows what causes what Joe was describing or anything we should be doing to minimize it. I mean, I think, are you talking about when Joe was just saying that people's um, audio and video were breaking up a little bit? And sometimes that just is due to your personal bandwidth on the internet. Um, things do fluctuate, you know, even though you've got the same modem sitting at your house. Um, there are some kind of natural little fluctuations, unfortunately. Um, and, you know, porcupines in the background, they cause we that. do have a lot of people on the line as well if things. Okay, Mr. Mr. Panesco, are we on schedule, sir? Go ahead. Okay. We will get back on our task. We are on agenda item seven, hydraulic prod project implementing implementing bills 1579, briefing and public hearing. Morgan, Randy, and Pat, I guess. We have three staff members. Good morning, Commissioner Carpenter and other commissioners. Um, Morgan here, can you see me and hear me all right? Okay. Um, well, you've got Randy and I, and the truth of the matter is that Randy is really the star of this show today. So um, I will make a, a brief introduction before turning it over to Randy. And I think she's going to walk you through um, the handout that we prepared for you today. Um, as the title indicates, we're here again to talk with you about um, hydraulic project approval, um, civil compliance rules, 
as the title suggests, these implement significant portions of the governor's um, so-called Orca Prey Bill. Um, you likely recall that um, when we spoke with you in February, we described a handful of changes that we were proposing to make to the staff proposal as a result of the public comment that we got in. Most of those changes were um, minor for clarity and they did not change the, the substance of the rules, uh, but one of those uh, did in fact propose to change the substance of the rules. And, and that was a request largely from the regulated community to provide some additional detail and clarity and transparency about how actual penalty amounts would be calculated for that portion of the rules. Um, so as a result, we uh, published a supplemental CR 102, and that's gonna be the focus of, of the remarks today um, is our briefing to you about um, the proposal that we are making about how to actually provide that transparency and clarity about, about how those penalties would be calculated. Um, so I, I think without further ado, Randy, I'll pass it over to you. Thank you, Margan. Thank you, commissioners. Um, as Margan stated, um, we, when we met with you in late February at your, on your conference call, uh, we had um, received nine comments and, and, and proposed actually nine changes as a result. Um, eight of those are, were minor and we discussed those in some detail with you uh, at the la on the conference call. Uh, we did end up making one change as a result of a comment that we got from Commissioner Thorburn um, on the, the description of the compliance program. Uh, making it read less like guidance and more like rule, I think is how Commissioner Thorburn described it. Um, but uh, we didn't have a lot of specificity on what the new penalty schedule would look like, and that was the major change that we needed to go out for the uh, and get uh, an additional public comments on and file the CR 102 for. Um, so um, what I thought I'd do today is just walk you through the penalty schedule if there's no que additional questions about those eight minor changes, um, if that's agreeable. I don't see anybody raising the hand or so I'm going to go uh, share my screen here. Hearing no objection. Ah, okay. So hopefully you can see my screen okay. The resolution's okay. We, we Looks good. Okay. So what we did for the penalty schedule is we had a concept when we came to you of looking at um, what the other resource agencies had done for the penalty schedule. So we looked at their statutes, rules, and, and uh, for DNR and ecology, we actually looked at some manuals too. Um, and what we came up with was a penalty schedule that really was modeled after DNR, um, forest practices penalty schedule with, a, with an ex one kind of big exception that I'll talk about in a few minutes. Um, um, but what we, uh, so what we went with was a base penalty plus a penalty for the, um, what's called special considerations. And in the statute, um, there's considerations that are listed for previous violation history uh, kind of severity and repairability of the damage, um, the intent and the cooperation. And so those are the special considerations. So for the base penalty, um, we really modeled this after the DNR forest practices. Um, so uh, some, uh, we have three basically um, items that would result in a $2,000 pe base penalty. Um, that's conducting a hydraulic project without a valid HPA. Uh, if you willfully misrepresent information on your HPA application, or there's a significant deviation from your HPA that ad adversely affects fish life. Um, so those are the three that would result in a $2,000 base penalty. And then all others would be a $500 base penalty. And this base penalty plus the special considerations would be the total penalty for the violation. So I'm just gonna walk down here. Is there any questions about the base penalty before I move on? All right. So um, in, in, the, in the rules, we had a description of what these 
um, special considerations are and that description re remains. But what we did to address the comments from the regulated community is we assigned some points in, to the descriptions. Um, so they, the points for previous violation uh, history and severity and repairability are higher than the points that you can that can be assigned for the intent and cooperation. Um, and this is also similar to what DNR force practices has done. Um, there's a total of 14 points that you can get uh, from this assessment. And I'll just walk through uh, maybe the severity and re re repairability of impacts to kind of describe how this would work. So something that would receive zero points would be something like a single family residence, resident stock that was um, constructed on a lake where we don't have any anadromous fish. It's a warm water fish lake and that was done without an HPA. Um, but the, the structure itself would have complied uh, complied with the hydraulic code standards and it would have complied with an HPA had we issued one for the project. So that would be an example of uh, something that wouldn't get, um, wouldn't, wouldn't get points assessed for severity and repairability. Um, for two points, an example would be that a, a culvert was, um, was in, project was started uh, late and um, has run beyond the authorized work time. Um, the project proponent didn't ex uh, ask for a modification of the HPA, but and as a result, um, there was a, the the bypass because it wasn't passable blocked adult migrating sa salmon for a week from moving upstream to spawning grounds. So that could be an example of kind of the two point range, um, and that's an impact you know that only lasted during for the duration of the construction activity. Uh, for four points, um, example would be a beaver dam removed without a permit. Uh, the dam impounded a wetland that provided important coho rearing habitat. Uh, during the removal, the water level dropped quickly, stranding fish and resulting in a fish kill. Uh, in addition, the, ha the wetland habitat no longer exists and is a major loss of rearing habitat on, for this particular stream system. So that would be an example of a, 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 a violation that will last beyond the construction activity. Um, so what we do is, um, again, this is a total of 14 points here. Um, where we deviated from the DNR forest practices example is how we then um, calculate the total penalty. Basically what DNR has done is they've taken the base penalty and used it as a multiplier. So if you had a, um, a violation that had a $2,000 base penalty, uh, you would only need four points in order to get to the $10,000 maximum penalty um, per day. Or I'm sorry, not per day, per violation. That was a big faux pas. <laughs> um, and so what we, we did instead is we looked at ecology. Um, ecology has a matrix and they, they um, <coughs> So but we chose to add, use the base penalty and add the, the point um, dollar amounts to it instead of using it as a multiplier. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, so what this, me what this means is, um, well, I'll just give you some example. I'll just go down here to the examples. Randy, would it be all right if I added to that a little bit? Sure. I apologize if you were gonna cover this, but um, we felt like using the base penalty as a multiplier because it got to higher penalty amounts faster. Um, we felt like that was often not appropriate given that so many of the clientele, um, nearly half or so who get HPAs in a given year are single family residences, sort of what we call the mom and pop applicants. Um, and that quick escalation to higher penalty levels didn't seem commensurate with that customer base as well as the types of violations. That <coughs> um, and so Randy, what Randy's going to walk through is uh, we felt a better reflection of a reasonable approach to um, address the types of violations, customers, and range that we see of violations. 
Yeah. So in the first scenario, um, this would be a violator that had more than one documented violation in the last five years. Um, there's an extensive or significant adverse impacts that last beyond the construction activity. So that's the four point maximum. Uh, the violation was foreseeable and no precautions were taken. And the violation violator did not report the violation or did not cooperate with, um, with department staff. So in this case, um, that would be 10 points. And, um, and uh, because the 10 points is $10,000, which is our maximum that we're proposing in our rules um, per violation, um, even with the base penalty, it would still be $10,000. Um, under DNR's uh, scenario, using a multiplier of the five, $500, for example, um, well, in this case, it wouldn't be 500, but if it was a, if it was a 10 point project and it was multiplied by 500, um, you would only, that would only be a $5,000 penalty. And um, something, you know, this severe, we felt um, is actually deserving of a higher penalty amount as well. So that's um, another reason why we deviated from me, from DNR's um, model and kind of went more with this matrix. Um, so basically it, um, you know, if you work, if you have a $2,000 base penalty, you'd have to get eight points to be at the max instead of four for DNR. But we're, we also get to, with DNR's model, you would never get to $10,000. The most you could ever get to would be $7,500 uh, for a $500 base penalty. Um, this is probably more gonna be kind of a more common scenario uh, where a violator doesn't have any uh, previous violation history. Um, there's adverse impacts to fish life, but it's minor and it doesn't extend beyond the duration of the construction activity. Uh, the violation wasn't foreseeable and the violator did not report the violation and, or they did not cooperate with department staff. It'd be more likely that they wouldn't report it. So in this case, um, the consideration points would give you a three thousand uh, dollar penalty amount that would be added to the base penalty of five hundred dollars, and the, so the total penalty for that violation would be thirty five hundred dollars. So that's how that works. I know that's kind of a. Um, is there any questions about that that I can answer? Question? Commissioner McKaysen. Isaac. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <clears throat> Question on the base penalty. In, in the handout, it seems to suggest that the base penalty is $2,000, period. <clears throat> Last example, you have a base of $500. Why mm -hmm. would that not be $2,000? So in this, in this second scenario? Yes, in that. Yeah, no. so to, to be $2,000, so in this case, in the second scenario, we're assuming that the violator had an HPA um, and there wasn't a significant deviation from, from the HPA, uh, although there was a deviation, um, but it wasn't significant. Um, um, so the $2,000 in this base penalty in this case wouldn't apply. Um, it only applies for those those three specific types of work. So the conducting without an HPA, you know, if they if they basically misrepresent information or um, were untruthful in their application, or there was a significant deviation, that would have been that would be a two thousand dollar base penalty if that occurred. Okay, and so yes. it's either five hundred or two thousand. There's no in between so that. that there, that's true. Yes, that's correct. Uh, if I may, Commissioner Baker. Commissioner Baker, did you have your hand up? Sorry, I was muted. Um, my question isn't about the arithmetic of, of calculating the permits. It's about the applicability of these penalties to groups in the state. And my specific question is whether Will these will this penalty schedule apply to those who are engaging in motorized suction dredge mining? 
Uh, yes, it'll apply to anybody that's doing a hydraulic project um, in the state. So that would include folks that are doing motorized mining. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Commissioner McKay, do you have another question? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. My question has to do with the top end of uh, $10,000, or maybe it's $12,000, I'm not sure. It's, uh, it's 10. It's 10, okay. Okay, yeah. So if there's a real grievous, uh, terrible situation here where somebody completely violates something and scrapes out a whole bunch of gravel out of the river right where the chum salmon have just spawned and the amount of fish resources that are lost in that one event is more than $10,000. Mm -hmm. um, is there an exception for those kind of grievous uh, problems or in that situation even then, um, or another one where there's a developer who's done something really bad in a subdivision. Anyway, is there some other spot for these great big uh, problems or is it 10,000 no matter how bad it is as a max? Yeah, um, that's a really good question. Um, and uh, another thing to keep in mind is these penalties go into the state general fund. So none of this money goes to restoration of the damage that was done. So um, the intent of the penalties is to be a deterrent I think in the, the, the situation that you described, Commissioner McIsaac, what I would recommend in that case is that we would go with criminal prosecution so we could get restitution and we could get, uh, we could get damage repaired. That was done as, you know, in those really egregious situations rather than using this civil tool. Yeah, okay, thank you. If I could have a follow-up to Commissioner McIsaac's question uh, and Commissioner Baker for that matter. What, what if you had a problem uh, individual or company and they had three violations in one year or two years? Is there three strikes you're out or something more severe to try and uh, curtail this uh, problem? Uh, I mean, it's, it, it boils down to an economic opportunity for some of these suction dredge minor people. We're not trying to put them out of business, but uh, we don't want them to put us out of business either. Right. So we do have... Um um, we do have another tool that was given to us in this legislation, which is called an in, intent to disapprove an HPA application. And so if somebody has uh, had violations or, well, if they have outstanding orders or notices or they haven't paid their civil penalties, um, we can actually deny them an, uh, an HPA until they uh, basically take care of uh, take care of their, you know, what's in arrears and come into compliance. Um, so but, that's. But, but Randy, if it's uh, if it's uh, uh, sole proprietorship or a small company, uh, I mean, they can go, you know, apply for and get a new DBA in a matter of a couple of days. And I don't. How would we track that? Good question. I'm not sure. I'd have to look into that. Um, yeah, I think, um, you know, I guess it would it depend if the violation was tied to the company or is tied to the, you know, the, the owner of the company. Um, um, Randy, but, uh, yeah. If I remember right, I'm trying not to talk too much. I understand my sound is not very good. But um, if I remember right, that part of the bill lets us look for who the violator was. Was it the landowner? Was mm -hmm. it the company? Was it another contractor? Um, so that flexibility is there. I think the other reality is that this is a very new tool to us. So there's a lot we don't know about how it will work. I think our intent would be to try to uh, keep the restrictions tied as closely as possible to the person or group that was responsible for those other violations. The other, the other option too, you know, if you have a repeat violator like that is to do the, is also the criminal prosecution. And I actually had a case where I had a, a person that violated like four times in a year. And um, as part of the, the settlement um, in the court, they, were, they, were, they weren't allowed to do any hydraulic projects for two years. So, you know, there are some other tools that we could always talk with enforcement about too. It might Thank be you. more appropriate. Mm -hmm. And Chair Carpenter, if, if I may, just briefly. Yeah, Joe. 
just just to, to reiterate uh, Randy's statements about criminal enforcement, the, the the criminal enforcement angle for HPA violations pre-existed this this recent legislation, which opened up the doors for the the civil enforcement. Um, so so this the, the civil enforcement was the legislature's effort to allow more of an educational based you know, leading them, leading the horse to the water effort uh, to, to gain compliance, as opposed to only having the strict hammer of a criminal case against someone. Um, the, you know, the Fish and Wildlife has been good on pursuing the criminal cases. The Attorney General's office itself actually prosecuted one of those cases for Fish and Wildlife, where there was an individual who just blatantly bulldozed the Tahuya River on the Kitsap Peninsula, and our office brought that case and did get a criminal uh, conviction against a bad actor who, who blatantly uh, de defied any of these restrictions and did significant modification to to a natural river course. So, you know, they're they're spot on. That that has always existed as authority, and it continues to to remain available to the agency. Thank you for the explanation, Joe. So. Um. I'm not sure uh, if there's no other questions. I'm not sure if there's public signed up to testify on this or not. Um, I don't have any information yet that tells me there are or how many there are uh, tests. Would you or yeah. Melissa? Yeah, I think at this time, I know we have at least one person, um, Rob Krebo, um, who does mm. want to say something. And I'm also just going to open it up as well. We are going to collect some public testimony using the raise the hand feature on Zoom. So if you dialed in on your phone to raise your hand, you can press star nine um, and then we'll be unmuting folks similar to how we did earlier this morning. Um, and if you're on the computer, um, look for that raise hand icon. And um, if it's okay with you, Larry, um, I'll go ahead and unmute Rob and get us started. That'd be great. Thank you. He already knows the three minute rule. I don't have to indoctrinate him. So. I will do my best to behave. Uh, good morning, afternoon, uh, members of the commission, Chair Carpenter and WDFW staff. Uh, this is Rob Crable, Northwest representative from Defenders of Wildlife calling from sunny South Tacoma this morning. Um, I want to start off by thanking all of you for uh, continuing to make these public meetings accessible to the public during this time of COVID-19. Um, I've expressed this to several uh, department staff. I've really appreciated the department's response to this uh, crisis and so quickly moving to these remote uh, access points. So just thank you for that. Uh, my comments will be brief. Uh, I'm mostly just uh, echoing uh, some of the written comments that I submitted to the commission and to uh, Randy yesterday on behalf of the Orca Salmon Alliance, which is a group of uh, 16 organizations ranging from small local ones to large national groups like Defenders of Wildlife. Um, we support these rules as written. Um, we worked really hard to pass uh, SHB 1579 last year, which these rules seek to codify some of the recommendations from that legislation. And we also really appreciate the department's uh, focus on deterring and voluntary compliance before moving into more of those strict civil penalties. We think that that's a really uh, great way to go about with uh, getting more folks to comply with these rules. And as you all know, this is an issue that uh, Defenders and the Orca Salmon Alliance are particularly concerned about given the importance of near shore and marine habitat for both juvenile Chinook and the forage fish that adult Chinook will predate on as they come back to spawn. The more that we can protect this habitat type, uh, the further we can advance our southern resident orca recovery efforts and make sure that we prevent the extinction of this very important species. Uh, the one thing that I would uh, recommend be added on to this is uh, as scientists, we are always looking for ways to adaptively manage. And I think it would be important for uh, the department to do some sort of monitoring of these rules to make sure that the uh, civil penalties that are put in place are actually performing the deterrent uh, that they were intended to perform. There's some concerns that some of the larger applicants may be able to roll, roll some of these uh, fees into their standard uh, cost of doing business. Um, so it would just be important to include some of those adaptive management and monitoring efforts. 
Um, but by and large, very happy with this, very supportive of it, and we urge the adoption of these rules. Rob, thank you for your testimony. Any questions of Rob? Hearing none, thank you, Rob. Thank you. All right. Um, next, we've got uh, Nora Nickham and Tina Whitman, you're on deck. Thank you very much. Good morning, Chair Carpenter, Commissions, and WDFW staff. My name is Nora Nickham, and I'm commenting on behalf of the Seattle Aquarium. The Seattle Aquarium strongly supports the proposed hydraulic code rules as they are written. These rules are vital for protecting forage fish, salmon, and orcas. A healthy nearshore habitat that supports these and other species is becoming increasingly scarce and improving WDFW's civil enforcement authority so it consistently, can consistently and firmly apply the hydraulic code will really help restore nat natural ecological processes that create and support this nearshore habitat. And echoing Rob's point, we also wanted to ask WDFW to be sure to carefully monitor these rules as they are implemented to make sure they're working as intended. So thank you for the opportunity to comment and we strongly urge the commission to adopt the proposed rules. Nora, thank you uh, for your comments. Any questions of Nora? Hearing none, thank you very much. Uh, next, please. All right, Tina Whitman. And Tina, yep, there you go. Yeah, I just unmuted. Thank you, Tina Whitman, Friends of the San Juans. Um, I also am um, provided written testimony, but I'm here today to support the um, hydraulic code rule amendments. Um, I think they're long overdue and um, fully supported by the science and also the public interest. Um, I manage shoreline habitat restoration research and protection projects in the San Juan since 2002. So we really see a lot of what's going on um, on the shorelines. Um, and we certainly all, I think, could agree that improved regulatory effectiveness um, is going to be an essential component of salmon recovery. Um, and also that our current regulatory framework um, is failing in many ways to stop the incremental and cumulative impacts to our shorelines that are supporting our marine food webs. Um, I think it's important to note that the understanding of the negative impacts of shoreline armoring and also the feasible alternatives that exist and the many programs that exist to help property owners um, are all things that are really new since this residential exemption was originally authorized. Um, things, the landscape has really changed and I think I recommend um, or I appreciate that this code is update is really acknowledging you know, that our technical and um, social systems have changed. Um, I also think it's so important for the state to provide consistent leadership on this issue, um, especially for small or rural communities with counties that lack the technical or financial resources, we're really left holding the line against new armoring or enforcement actions. So these updates will really help address that gap. Um, and I think it's also important just to note that Healthy Shorelines is not just supporting fish and wildlife, it's supporting our communities and our um, economies. Um, the shorelines are, all, of course, providing rearing habitat for juvenile Chinook salmon, supporting our orca, but our shorelines are also the foundation of our economy, our human economy. Um, so again, I'm just um, here to talk in support of these um, code rules that reflect scientific understanding and also our public opinion, um, and I really encourage you to in, um, adopt these rules. Thank you. Thank you, Tina, for your comments. Any questions of Tina this morning or this afternoon now? Thank you. Uh, what's next, Tess? Um, I don't see any other um, members of the public with their hand raised. Um, that's star nine on the phone or the hand raise icon. So if we don't see anyone um, in the next moment, uh, then we'll be able to move forward. And I don't see any hands up from the commission. So I think we're about to put a wrap. Margan and Randy, thank you very much uh, for your work. and look forward to hearing the next steps. Thank you. Thank you. And hopefully we'll see you on the 24th with uh, the plan is to come back on the 24th and ask for uh, uh, for uh, your vote on this. So. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, we will move on to um, agenda item eight. Uh, C3619 hatchery policy. This is a briefing and public comment. Uh, Lori Peterson. 
And just one moment here. Let's make sure to bring Lori over. And just so everyone remembers, as we uh, wrap up this this item, we will have a short uh, uh, meeting wrap up and uh, future meeting discussion for a few moments. Thank you, Commissioner uh, Chair Carpenter and Commissioners. And I'm going to be sharing my screen now and get up the PowerPoint I have for you today. Yeah. Let's see. Great. All right. So I'm Lori Peterson, the uh, Fish Science Division Manager at the department. Really glad to be here today. Ron Warren often uh, briefs you on this project with me, and he's busy in the midst of the uh, North of Falcon PFMC meetings, so he couldn't be here. But I'm um, thrilled to be here and give you a, another project update. There have been a few of these in recent months. And then I uh, will be, I understand, taking guidance from the commission today on, on next steps with the project. So just to take us back to June 2018, when the project began, uh, the Fish and Wildlife Commission uh, had the decision to review all sections and aspects of our hatchery and fishery reform policy. Uh, C 3619 and suspend policy guidelines one, two, and three for salmon species other than steelhead. And we were assigned uh, the review to include examining performance results since the policy was adopted, conducting a full scientific review, um, and that would include the last 10 years or so of emerging science, and providing alternatives for possible policy changes. So throughout this project, we've used this metaphor of the three-legged stool. So I'll use that here to illustrate our project elements. Um, the objective is the policy, a, a fulsome policy review. And one leg of that stool is our science review, including, as I mentioned, the emerging science. And um, we'll have more slides on that, but that review has been completed. Uh, the second leg is the policy performance evaluation. And just yesterday, we had a workshop with commissioners on the results of our policy performance um, and implementation report. And the third leg is a joint co-manager hatchery benefits document. We are uh, dialoguing with the co-managers on that document and getting going a bit on it. Um, we don't have an outline yet, but um, definitely conversations going back and forth and we're, I think we're, we're heading in that direction. So uh, project elements um, are also, of course, engaging our tribal co-managers in policy development, uh, reaching out to our, our partners, um, salmon recovery partners, uh, NOAA fisheries and others, as well as uh, the general public. And then uh, ultimately the commission will consider all of our final reports, recommendations, and alternatives for possible policy changes. For that first leg uh, of the stool, the science review uh, document, including emerging science, we have completed that. Um, the Washington Academy of Sciences um, completed their third and final review of our document um, at the end of October of 2019. And we incorporated their comments as well as uh, reviews of others. And by the uh, end of January, 2020, we did distribute our document uh, to commissioners, tribes, partners, and the public so they could read it and review it. Uh, we completed a science review workshop with commissioners on February 6th recently, which uh, was, uh, went very well. And I was really proud of our staff and the work they did from science division. Um, and so currently, uh, Joe Anderson and Ken Warheit, our lead research scientists on that paper, along with uh, others on our team, are addressing any follow-up questions commissioners had and, uh, and their input. The second leg of the stool, the policy review and evaluation work, um, that also has been um, a lot of work. I'm really proud of our staff, Andrew Murdoch and uh, Gary Marston, the co-authors that worked on a draft uh, policy implementation review document. Uh, 
And they distributed that uh, February 7th for you all to read and review. Um, so this document reviews uh, our policy performance of 3619 since adoption in 2009. And uh, the 11 policy guidelines are reviewed um, in a green, yellow, red stoplight. We also had orange in there, a uh, report card format relative to defined performance metrics. And then yesterday we completed the workshop uh, via webinar format with the commission um, and felt that that went really well. This slide is our um, timeline moving forward for this project. And so I'll start in the upper left corner, it's February 2020, when we did um, have our science review workshop. And we had a, a Fish and Wildlife meeting where I gave the project status update, like I'm doing now. We had time for public comments. And also at the end of February, that orange arrow on the bottom indicates we had a, a critically important meeting with our tribal co-managers at Muckleshoot Casino, where we did receive um, tri tribal co-manager input. We had another one of those as a Zoom webinar call on April 3rd, so just, just recently, last Friday, in which we received input from our tribal co-managers, especially uh, the Puget Sound tribes and coastal tribes. Um, so here we are, the red box is April, right now, 2020, we're at the Fish and Wildlife Commission meeting for this update. Um, we had, as mentioned, this policy performance workshop yesterday morning. And we're here to also receive guidance on next steps, um, possible uh, consideration of policy language alternatives. We will also have a chance for public comment after uh, this presentation. Lori, if I may, uh, Jim Anderson uh, has a question, has his hand up. Sure. You gotta unmute yourself, Jim. Oops, sorry about that. Um, I wanted to reflect a little bit on what you said with regard to the science report. Uh, in Kennewick, um, uh, the commission talked about uh, the science report as being a, a um, work in progress and that it was a, a draft and that the, there was uh, still uh, opportunity and uh, engagement with others um, uh, to go on, and I just wanted to clarify that uh, it's a work, a draft uh, a report. So our our research scientists uh, went through the um, Washington State Academy of Sciences um, and worked with with them for about a year. They provided the guidance, and so to to maintain the integrity of that process, there were eight independent scientists that reviewed it. Um, the, our research scientists are calling it complete from their perspective. However, we are uh, totally open to some follow-up work. So working on um, an additional technical memorandum, um, other work to uh, incorporate tribal and commissioner input, any other input. And so that's the perspective from our um, our staff's view at this point, but we can certainly work with you. Yes, well, I think our review um, sees it as a, a piece of a bigger uh, picture and that it's a, it's a science piece as uh, the um, uh, review of the uh, implementation uh, is, a, is a piece uh, and the hatchery benefits uh, work is a piece. So uh, at least the way I'm looking at this is that we've got a number of different uh, parts, none of which is complete until we uh, have uh, the right mix of things in front of us and decisions uh, are made by the uh, policy decisions are made. So. All right. Thank you, Commissioner Anderson. Any other input before I move on? All right, so um, I understand from the fish committee meeting uh, that was held yesterday, um, and I've updated this timeline that in June, um, 
the mm -hmm. staff will bring draft policy language for review and commissioner feedback and guidance at the uh, June Fish Committee meeting. Then um, in midsummer, to be announced, uh, we're thinking there'll be another tribal co-manager engagement um, consultation meeting. Mm -hmm. Then moving to the right of the timeline, uh, July, August, 2020, we've got a Fish and Wildlife Commission meeting scheduled. I think it's in Aberdeen, um, in which we'll have a markup draft version of the policy for public review. And by October 2020, we will have the two-step decision process by the commission on the revised policies, I understand it. That's the, that's the goal <laughs> here for the timeline. Uh, at each of these points in the yellow boxes, we show the opportunity for public comment. Um, we also got a bar toward the bottom here, the co-managers hatchery benefits document. That's what we're calling it. It's basically looking at um, an ecosystems framework, socio-ecological uh, benefits provided by hatcheries such as food in the form of fish for tribal and non-tribal communities and um, legal considerations like treaty rights and going more into those subjects that um, we definitely referred to and touched on in the other documents but couldn't explore fully. So this, this third document, we're calling it the hatchery benefits document I'm uh, looking forward to working with the tribes on that in the coming weeks and months. I know they're very busy with North of Falcon and COVID-19 response, so they haven't been able to meet on it yet, but um, I think we'll get there. And throughout, we've had, uh, throughout the process, public and partner involvement, and of course, working with, with you all on the commission in um, fish committee monthly updates. Next slide. The final slide is just a uh, conglomeration of different pictures <laughs> from our hatcheries over the years and different scenes around Washington State. Um, and I'd like to see if you have any questions or comments, topics for discussion. Mr. Chairman. Commissioner McKaysey. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thanks, Lori, for a nice presentation again. Um, a uh, couple of comments on the two draft reports and then maybe a question on the, uh, on the hatchery benefits report, uh, table of contents at least anyway. So um, on, on the two uh, reports, I think following up on Commissioner Anderson's comment, maybe it's a matter of just being careful about the word complete uh, when it's described. There are portions of that that I, I presume are complete, but as, as we move toward finalizing the report to the spot where it could be released, you mentioned a technical memorandum. There's also some other input that they were going to respond to. There were some valuable things that were added at the workshop that uh, would be very useful. Remembering that the purpose of the paper is, uh, is to uh, uh, you know, help the commission's considerations. So it's just a matter of calling um, the the, uh, when we call it complete, I guess it would be when it's released by the agency as a final uh, entire endeavor. Mm -hmm. on, the, uh, on the draft report uh, that we had the workshop on, uh, let me say thanks again uh, to you and the staff for the good work on Thursday morning. All the folks that uh, put that together spent a lot of time on that. There was some additional material uh, that was shown to us in the PowerPoint that was not in the draft document released Oh, a month or so ago, and it's uh, important to have that in there, uh, in particular where the, uh, the uh, original assignment is described. I think it'd be good for that to be in there. We didn't quite get to those last couple of examples, uh, so, uh, so it'd be good to, to uh, maybe see another draft of that uh, as we move through time at some point. Uh, it would uh, also be helpful for the authors to consider some of the questions that came up at the workshop and, and any other comments from commissioners or other folks in finalizing the draft in a similar manner to uh, to the policy report. So, uh, but at any rate, okay. um, it's, uh, uh, it was very good to have the workshop over. We're into the language phase now and thanks to you and all the folks involved. Sure thing, our pleasure, thank you. 
Are there any other questions or comments for uh, Lori Peterson? Okay, Lori, thank you very much. Do we uh, have any uh, public comment, uh, uh, Tess? It looks like we do have a couple uh, raised hands. So let's go ahead um, and start off with Ron Garner and then Spencer Rusin is going to be um, on deck. Very good. Thank you. And Ron, make sure to look for that um, unmute microphone as well on your computer. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, I there's several of our guys that are working on right now PFMC North of Falcon. And I'm, if I can maybe speak for them later if they can't get on. But I don't have as quite a rosy a view of this document. Um, Butch Smith, uh, Dave Kroonquist, myself, um, Dave Johnson, Frank Urbeck, we've all been working this. And um, what we see is we've, we've been working between commission and tribes and talking about this a lot. We feel like this, uh, this paper, this Academy of Sciences paper went rogue. We don't feel like it followed the protocols that were asked for by the commissioners. So I'm gonna read what I've written. Points for the WAS Andrew Murdoch research report paper that need embedded into the document itself. The paper has to go on record and stamped as, a, stamped as an invalid document by the commission. There are plans for this document to become a new white paper, which will become the basis for many lawsuits against the state for years to come. I've already received copies from the public pointing to its findings and trying to use it, which will come back later, possibly to undo this policy. Reasons are below. Number one, none of the tribal input was used in the document skewing its output. Number two, commission direction and protocols were not followed. Number three, Draft wording removed from the WSAS document without authorization as it was not final nor adopted and in some cases the direction was outright ignored. Draft wording must formally be added back to document. Four, data that was not complete or could be evaluated fully was omitted instead of documented as such. Was a biased report therefore deems it inaccurate. Five, was mistakenly sent out as to be in full compliance that it did not have. Tribal input was omitted and the included tribal scientists disagree with the findings. Gives it the perception this draft document was final. This paper must go on record at this point, stamped as an invalid document until final by the commission, ensuring that in later years it does not repair, reappear as a white paper. That is my biggest gist of what's going on with this. Lori, can you take your PowerPoint down because I can't see uh, on my screen with that on who, who might have their hand up to recognize other commissioners, if no one minds. Thank you. Any uh, questions or comments of Ron Garner? Okay, hearing none, uh, Tess, next please. Sure. Uh, Spencer, you're up next, and Butch Smith, you're on deck. Yeah, can you hear me? Uh, a little bit. You're a little bit broken yes, up. Can you but... hear me? I just want to basically take a minute and uh, touch, you know, touch base with everybody and, and uh, bring apart an important impact um, that we're going through right now, and that is the closure of fishing in North Falcon for winter fisheries this coming year. That seems more likely than not. Um, and it's just huge impact for our local economy and, uh, and our rights as uh, citizens in this state to, uh, to hope to not have further restrictions and in fact, uh, hope to increase fish numbers uh, for years to come. Thank you, Spencer. Uh, uh, Tess, next, please. Yep. Um, Butch, you're up next, and Greg King um, will be on deck. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Butch Smith, uh, on seven days and about uh, 300 hours of webinars, I took a step away from the PFMC uh, process, took my chairman hat up here, and came to uh, 
uh, be recognized Butch Smith, president of the Waco Charter Association, also a port commissioner, chairman, and on uh, various committees of the on the state. Um, I would echo exactly what Ron Gardner said, but um, I heard some things yesterday. I was able to dribble in and out and get some excerpts of the uh, of your fish committee meeting yesterday, and I was really uh, mortified when I heard the um, Murdoch, uh, Mr. Murdoch, say that. Uh, uh, this, per this uh, policy hasn't hurt uh, fishing at all. Um, I was really saddened. And uh, I, I understand if Mr. Duck Murdoch spends most of his time in Eastern Washington, but I do invite him to come to the coast and see what devastation looks like. You wanna talk about the coronavirus? HSRG was the virus that started in 2002, uh, not formally adopted till 2008. And it's been killing coastal communities ever since not only our coastal communities, but our tribes, um, and look at Puget Sound. Uh, Chairman Carpenter, we've been in this uh, fish management uh, helping for a long time, longer than I'd hate to, hate to uh, uh, admit. And when have you had to take a, you know, they're gonna lose their winter fisheries. Uh, we used to tease and, and sadly, and most of all the ocean was jealous. Uh, Puget Sound used to be the, sacred cow that always got to fish no matter what. And uh, um, that wasn't quite the truth that, you know, they, but it just seemed like that way when you came from the ocean and now they're losing their whole, almost their entire winter fisheries. Um, let me give you an example of some, of some HSR, uh, partly HSRG um, numbers. Uh, you've heard me say this, but I've broken them down. Uh, from 92 to 2016, you are now producing 64 million less coho in Chinook in Puget Sound, uh, 28 million just in Chinook alone. The Columbia River is from 1992 to 2018 is 170 million less smoke production in Chinook and coho. Statewide, uh, pushing up of about 165 million. You cannot tell me that that production has not hurt and it doesn't continually to hurt um, when ocean conditions um, are what they are right now. Um, it has a big effect because zero production of any percent is still zero. I don't care what school you went to, even a kid from El Waco can, can figure that out. Um, it, is, it is imperative that you guys have the uh, you have the cure to this virus, and it and it's time we we gave it the old college try. Um, it, it is it is not working. Another example, just so you know, um, Lower Columbia River Falls Chinook. Those that's a NOAA that's a NOAA hatchery, not a state hatchery. If NOAA went by the strict uh, HSRG policies like the state does. Um, they would be raising 71% uh, uh, less Thule or Lower Columbia River Chinook than they are now. And those Chinook uh, go clear up to uh, Canada, uh, feed uh, fisheries, sport and tribal and commercial fisheries, all the way down into the buoy 10 fisheries and higher. And they also feed uh, orca whales. So it appears this HSRG virus has not only caused its devastation on the coast and in Puget Sound, but it also spread out to, to the orca whales. Thanks, uh, Butch. You are at three minutes. So if you well, um, just want to uh, yeah. let you know, you've hit that time for your last comments. Uh, Tess, he gets a little longer as an elected uh, individual. We'll give him another oh, minute. Oh, fantastic. Great. Yeah. Thank you. So, sorry, Tess. Uh, my fault. I didn't see the clock. I, in closing, uh, I think you guys are doing an amazing job. Um, you know, some of this policy was ingrained out of a political uh, political process, which is never good to interject a political process into a science process. process. And I wanna commend the commission for the work they're doing and, and continue to replace this policy. Uh, we support that on the coast. Mm -hmm. our, our, tribal, our tribal friends also support it. And let's get this ship righted back so we can get to some reasonable fisheries and save the orca whale. Thank you very much. Butch, uh, thank you very much for your comments, uh, Butch. And uh, 
uh, I hope you uh, get off a uh, webinar here shortly, to maybe later today. Any questions of Butch Smith? Thanks again. Okay, uh, Tess? Yeah, it looks like we've got one more one more hand up from Greg. Butch, did I just cut you off? Did you? Okay. Um, and if we have any other um, comments after Greg, please take the time right now to get that hand raised so um, we can slot you in. Otherwise, Greg will be our last caller. Greg King, uh, good afternoon, Chair Carpenter and Commission. I have to cur concur with my two colleagues, uh, Mr. Gardner and Mr. Smith. I uh, totally agree with what they're saying. Um, you guys put out a guidance letter yesterday. Yesterday was awful long, and, and I have to concur with Butch about Mr. Murdoch saying it was uh, not detrimental to our fisheries. I noticed this guidance letter you put out today. We have asked at our Talents Advisory Group meetings why the state isn't managing for SARs adult returns and we never get a real answer um, that would give us a, a a good indicator of how our fisheries are doing and i also see in this guide letter you have we have four h's we talk about all the time but there isn't anything about predation and in in that all h strategy shouldn't there be a part for predation now since we're we're dealing with these predation huge predation problems on the columbia river and anyway, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to also tell you about these stray rates. We did a, the USGS did a, a study in, I think it was a three-year study on the Calus River summer run steelhead. And they showed a stray rate of 1%, which is minuscule on these stray rates. So this is just food for thought for the commission. Also, in Tacoma Power's fish hatchery management plan, this came out in 2019, 2019 they said that tributaries below Mayfield Dam were either extinct or going extinct. And we're using weirs in these streams and there's nothing in these streams to try to separate hatch from wild. There's kids are extinct. And, you know, I, I just feel that some of this um, stuff we're doing here i have to concur with butch and ron you know uh this is you guys know what to do um you need to guide us and 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 produce some fish i mean we're getting, we're showing no season no spring chinook season on the gallet no fall chinook season on the gallet and barely getting any fish back and it's because of constraints of hsrg anyway that's just my food for thought for today and thanks that's my comment Greg, thanks for calling in. Any questions of Greg? Okay, Tess, I understand we have another uh, speaker. Yes, looks like we've got Robert Sudar has a comment. So go ahead and get yourself. We've got you unmuted on our end if you want to look for that unmute button on your end, Robert. Perfect. Yeah, thanks, uh, commissioners, for this opportunity to comment. Um, Rob Sudar, commercial advisor from the Columbia. Um, I was wasn't able to watch the presentation yesterday morning. I did listen to the fish committee meeting yesterday. And I looked over the report from yesterday morning. I thought that the uh, changes that were presented at the end of the fish committee meeting, the updates to the policy were good ones. I think they address things that uh, we need to be considering. I think we've done good things in our hatcheries and not mixing fish between watersheds, trying to get local stock for production in the hatcheries. Those are all good things. We don't, we can, can continue to do those uh, within our policies. Um, I think that it's good to remove the mandates on mark selective fisheries. I think that is a tool for managers that works in some situations, doesn't work in others. There's no reason to force that, let the managers make those decisions that are capable of making those choices. Uh, I like the addition of adaptive management being brought into this policy. Um, it's essential in any policy that there be some adaptive management because there are few tools for the public to use other than adaptive management to try to bring needed changes to a policy. I, uh, I, I hope that everybody looks at slide 27 in yesterday's long report and notices uh, under alternative gear that tangle nets were the primary gear that was used over the course of that study um 
but we don't get any credit for that as an alternative gear in the conversations. Um, it was effective in spring Chinook harvest until it, or we lost our main stem spring Chinook harvest. It was effective in some good coho years. I think we need to get credit for the useful, uh, for tangle nets as an effective, useful tools that the managers should be able to use. And uh, there was also some discussion yesterday about changing wild in the report to natural production. And I, that works great for biologists, but in the marketplace, wild is still the term, not natural. And I completely understand what the, what the intent was yesterday, but I think that um, we need to make sure that we don't provide another term that confuses the general public. They see wild and farmed fish as two very distinct groups. Wild includes wild production and natural um, hatchery, produ hatchery production. And so I think we need to keep that in mind that there's more than just what the biologists talk about. There's also about what the markets talk about, what the general public talks about. So I think those are the main things I wanted to consider. I, uh, like I said, I'm in favor of what was presented yesterday at the end of the fish committee meeting as a new framework for modifying this. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Robert, for your comments. Any questions of Robert? Hearing none, Robert, thank you very much. Thank okay, you. that uh, concludes uh, the, li the listed agenda for today. We were gonna put a few minutes out here for- Mr. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman. Commissioner McIsaac. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Before we leave this agenda item, I think it's important that the full commission consider the fish committee recommendation and I'd be prepared to make a simple motion uh, for the commission to adopt the fish committee recommendation uh, that's listed under this agenda item. We have a motion, do we have a second? I'll second it. Was that you, uh, Commissioner? Uh, okay. Right. Okay. <clears throat> Commissioner McKay, do you want to speak to the motion? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll be very brief. Uh, we've had our couple of planned workshops. We've uh, had some uh, meetings with our tribal co-managers. Uh, we had a thorough discussion yesterday at, at the fish committee. And I think it's useful for the staff to get this direction in writing so that they can proceed to the next step. And this is uh, something that should come from the full commission. Any further discussion? Okay, hearing none. All uh, uh, Commissioner, Commissioner Carpenter, as Commissioner Thorburn, if I could speak to the motion as well. Commissioner Thorburn. Um, <clears throat> I had a, a chance, to, I, I was not at the fish committee yesterday, but I've had a chance to look at the, um, the document that's referred to in the motion. Um, as, as I've um, been through this review and um, seen the documents produced by our, um, our, our uh, staff, as well as listened to the constituents, I've come to wonder what, whether we should continue to call this um, the hatchery reform policy. I'm thinking perhaps it's appropriately titled the hatchery policy. Um, I think that um, uh, there are lots of lots of standards established in different ways um, for our uh, for our hatcheries. Uh, we have ESA requirements. We have Mitchell Act requirements. Um, <clears throat> And uh, we have uh, the uh, permits for each of the, the hatcheries, uh, the anadromous or, or the, the, um, the, the hatcheries that uh, deal with in, um, endangered fish. Um, and what becomes, uh, what was stood out for me yesterday um, as we listened to the presentation um, it was uh, we really need to improve on um, evaluation, monitoring and evaluation. And um, that means being very clear about um, goals and objectives of the, uh, the hatcheries, of each of the hatcheries, as well as 
um, uh, basins and um, <clears throat> uh, other um, things that are impacted by hatcheries. Um, so it, it, it um, doesn't strike me that really what we're talking about with the revisions is hatchery reform, um, but we're talking about hatcheries and how they're managed um, and um, uh, evaluated, monitored and evaluated. Um, so that's just um, something that I've thought about uh, in regards to this motion. Would you like to make an amendment to the motion? Mr. Chairman. Um, One moment, let me finish with Commissioner Thorburn first. Uh, no. Sure, I would um, amend the motion to, to retitle it I, uh, as, as the hatchery policy and instead of the hatchery reform policy. Okay, Commissioner McIsaac. <clears throat> well, uh, I guess properly we would look for a second, but maybe before there's a second, I would make a note that the Fish Committee recommendation agrees pretty well with what Commissioner Thorburn has just said, and you'll see that it does recommend a change to a title of Anadromous Salmon and Steelhead Hatchery Policy. That's in the, uh, uh, that's in the uh, recommendation. So it's not exactly the motion that was perhaps made, but the point about reform or hatchery operations, I think the thinking is very consistent with what, uh, what we just heard from Commissioner Thorburn. So to be clear, the Fish Committee recommendation, as you'll see, is point A in what's posted as a document. It says, change the title to reflect a hatchery policy only, delete fishery reform from the title, and it says, anadromous salmon and steelhead hatchery policy. So if this went forward, uh, the uh, instructions to the staff would be specific in that particular area. Now I'll come back to the commission sooner or later, but I just maybe would make the, the uh, maker of the motion aware of that. Before. So uh, thank, thank you for that clarification. I'll withdraw the uh, motion for the amendment. Okay. Commissioner Thorburn moves to strike the motion. Thank you. Okay, uh, uh, Commissioner Anderson. I just just to uh, uh, place a point on that. Uh, it's important to make sure that we're not confusing uh, our salmon and steelhead hatchery policies uh, with trout hatcheries and, and and the like too. So just I think the the action that we didn't take is good because we need to think about making sure that we don't confuse things as we're trying to clarify things. <laughs> Very good point. <laughs> Thank you, Commissioner Anderson. Is, are there any other comments from the commission? Everybody's smiling, so I'll call for the question. All those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Opposed, Aye. same sign. Aye. Motion carries. Thank you all. We will move now to a brief meeting wrap up discussion and potentially future meeting planning. Don, I know you said uh, earlier you had something you wanted to say on, in, uh, in this arena, and uh, I'm sure others do as well. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, and let me start by saying as a matter of debrief, thanks to Nikki and all the staff uh, and uh, our wonderful contractors who pulled off this uh, two-day Zoom conference call meeting so that we could conduct our important business. Uh, I wanted to follow up on what uh, Deputy Director Winthrop said earlier about uh, the uh, emergency proclamation that goes through May 4th and that there's been some discussion with some of the public already about how we um, ease out of where we're at now. Whether that be on, Mar on May 5th or later in the summer or in the fall, no one knows. But, you know, we did delegate emergency action to the director for fishing and hunting rules. And the best example is the clam season where the night before it was to occur, the local counties wanted it closed and uh, there would have been no chance for a commission meeting to, to deal with that. Uh, so, um, but there are, are some other things that uh, I think it would be good for us to, to get into, and that does get into easing back into normalcy at some point in time and letting the public know what's coming so it's not a knife edge type of situation. Um, I would make, and in terms of uh, her request for some input from the commission commissioners, I would just offer this, that the governor's order says securing food is essential. 
And sport fishing does have a subsistence element. And we've got some crab fishing that could be going on now, some shrimp fishing that's coming up, and regular, many regular fisheries that many families have consistently relied on uh, for subsistence type food and uh, improves their diet over some of their other alternatives. And you can imagine that a person crabbing from a boat with his family members on board is not endangering themselves or any the other folks with regard to virus exposure, particularly if they left a dock where, uh, where they had their boat moored. It's also been interesting to see our neighboring states in Oregon and California where they've dealt with the same thing, where instead of closing all fishing, uh, they've got crowded charter boat type fisheries closed. Um, they have uh, you know, whale watching boats closed. Uh, they've done some more surgical spot closures without closing fishing entirely. And again, it gets to a point where if, uh, you know, one uh, person wanted to go fly fishing on their bluegill pond on their own property, technically fishing statewide is closed. And uh, someone going out on their own boat to go smallmouth bass fishing somewhere is not really, uh, it's, it's consistent with the desire to make things stay safe. And I would just say that if the complete blunt closure reduces 100 people from going sport fishing, and as we ease into this, we can open it up to 25 people who are not gonna be endangering uh, themselves or the others or adding to virus exposure, that we ought to do that. And I think some of the concern about uh, equity and fairness uh, may have been a little bit overstated. And now it's getting to the point where people are questioning how fair it is for people to go do something that's pretty safe. It's at least as safe as biking and hiking, which we're in the proclamation listed as essential uh, recreation activities. So as we move toward May 4th, I guess, if we're doing some outreach with some public folks, it'd be interesting for the commissioners to hear more about that and make sure that all the perspectives are entertained as we get closer to the next decision, if it's not in an emergency manner that has to be done tomorrow. Thank you, Commissioner McKenzie. Commissioner Baker? So deviating like Don just a tiny bit from your um, from the future meeting planning, although this has something to do with that. I just wanted to make one quick point, which was that um, Amy uh, referred today to the budget and the fact that the governor's vetoes for COVID-19 were harsh, but they didn't um, cause us structural problems. And all in all, we got through both the signing of the budget and the governor's vetoes pretty well. The one, one thing that I wanted to highlight was that there was one veto that I think hurt and I'd like us all to think about as we begin our budget building process. And that is there's $400,000 of ongoing money for invasive species uh, detection for the quarter mussels. And um, this is mostly directly affects Eastern Washington. Uh, but the fact is, if those mussels get in our waterways, we're going to have damage in the billions, not the millions, uh, both to the irrigation systems and the dams. So I just wanted to highlight what I consider, this is my own personal opinion, the harshest veto that we got, and ask us to think about that as we begin our budget building process. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Baker, for those comments. Um, anyone else have any uh... Hi, this is, this is Dave. Burke. I have my hand up. Um, I agree with uh, Mac Don McIsaac's comments about these closures and also thinking back to uh, Commissioner Thornburn's comments earlier in our meeting. Um, what I would like to request is, I believe, Amy, you said that there are meetings coming up next week addressing this issue of the fishing closures and how you may uh, deal with the process of getting back to normal. Um, I would like to know when those meetings will occur, if there's opportunity for myself as a commissioner or the public to uh, provide input during that process or observe the process. Um, I think what Don has to say is very important. Uh, that we send a message to our 
constituents in the um, recreational fishing arena uh, that, that were seriously looking at ways to get them back outdoors and on the water in a safe manner. You know, I'm not talking about suspending all these rules, but we've all seen a lot of options provided us uh, via email or other sources uh, that offer up alternatives to these closures that would keep the public in a, still in a safe mode. So I'm, I would, first of all, I'd like to know if there's an opportunity to learn about these meetings, if they're gonna be shared with the public, or if our commissioners can access these meetings and participate in the discussion. So, Mr. Chair, I, I have a- I, I have, have your hand, one second. Amy, could you just hold your thoughts until we conclude the, co the, the uh, commission's questions and then you can respond? Bob uh, Keogh, please, commissioner. Yeah, thank you. Um, <clears throat> and appreciate uh, Commissioner McIsaac's comments and uh, Commissioner Graybill's comments. Uh, and then, of course, um, Commissioner Thorburn, uh, when we opened up the meeting. And um, I mean, I, I, I understand the, uh, how people want to get back out outside and fishing and hunting. And, um, but at, at the same time, I think we all need to realize that these are extraordinary times that we're dealing with. Uh, we all have been hearing about concerns about, you know, if we try to open things up too early, we may end up going backwards in terms of, um, uh, in terms of uh, uh, flattening the curve, if you will. And I think the other thing that we need to be definitely considerate of is that uh, in times of crisis like this, um, we have, uh, we need to rally around um, our leader. And our leader here in the state of Washington is Governor Inslee. And uh, I know we may uh, sometimes have our own uh, disagreements with, uh, with Governor Inslee and the things that he does, but I think it would be a mistake if we were to, um, uh, if we were to go uh, outside of what the governor's directions are. Uh, so I think we need to be very mindful of that. And I know, Amy, I, I'm sure you are working very closely with the governor's office. And I'm sure you're advocating uh, uh, for, uh, you know, where appropriate openings. But I think it would be a mistake for the commission to, um, you know, be too forceful uh, and and call for things that are inconsistent what the governor is is doing. So, um, and the reason is not only for health, but I think uh, in terms of uh, uh, unanimity in in um, in uh, challenging uh, this virus and getting it under control. So, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Keogh. First, uh, Commissioner McIsaac, then Commissioner Anderson, and then I would like to go to Amy for a wrap, and if there's no objections, Commissioner McIsaac. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And let me say that I agree uh, with almost everything that uh, Commissioner Keogh has just said, and I certainly am not advocating going against what the governor has said. And the governor has said there are certain recreation things that are essential actually the wording says essential like hiking and biking and there's a presumption that people when they do go biking they're not going to be packed together like a tour de france race and you have to rely on the public to have some common sense in that and when they go hiking some social distancing too all i'm saying is working with the governor and letting uh, him and his staff know that there are some specifics in the world of fishing and probably hunting as well that could be entirely consistent with the approach that he's been taking in terms of safety to the public. And, uh, you know, again, the example of, well, there's several of examples you heard me uh, say, I could say more, but there are some where people can go out and be absolutely consistent with what is already being defined as, uh, as, uh, as essential and provide some subsistence to so i'm with you commissioner kehoe on being cautious here i'm talking about easing our way into it 
setting our sights on May 4th for a decision point. And then if that really means the summer or some other time, continuing to work out, but thinking about something other than the straight guillotine. Thank you, Commissioner McKay. Commissioner Anderson. Uh, yes, uh, reiterating pretty much what uh, Commissioner Keel and McIsaac just said, but um, you know, obviously the the governor's uh, uh, where he's at, and and he's the leader, and I agree with that. Um, I think all good leaders want input, and I think we have a process uh, to do that. I want to thank the staff for all the hard work that has been done. Uh, to date, um, you know, I think we are all feeling it um, personally and, you know, in our roles as commissioners and uh, hearing from people and, and the like, but uh, know full well that, that this is a very critical time and the, the governor and the, um, the state have, have been leading in a way that's, I believe, showing positive results and and I think we want to uh, encourage that. You know, I think in these times, uh, issues, uh, uh, difficult issues, the, the term grace is uh, particularly important and the need to, um, to uh, be graceful and uh, accept certain things that we can't quite understand or fully support knowing that there is a legitimate um, reason for all this. And so, you know, I want to keep my Lutheran theology down, but, uh, but basically I think that um, we, if we're graceful, we'll look past this time. Um, we'll recognize that we took the right kinds of action and, and I think uh, we'll feel good about this uh, uh, over time. Well stated. Thank you, Commissioner Anderson. Uh, Amy, would you like to respond? Yeah, thank you, uh, Chair Carpenter. Um, I really appreciate uh, all of the conversation today, and I know that you all are bearing um, the same burden that we are bearing here uh, in the department in terms of the leadership around this issue. And I know that your emails probably look a lot like our emails, and it's very hard to um, to stand in, in this place and try to do the right thing. When the reality is uh, outside of Commissioner Thorburn, um, you know, neither Kelly nor I know what to do. And we are uh, looking to guidance from the governor's office and to the public health professionals. And we are doing our best to listen to what is needed um, and then to implement that in a way that is in keeping with how how we deliver fisheries and hunting opportunities um, and what we know about them. And so, uh, so it's hard. I, I just, I'll just say that in that, um, you know, we, as we move forward, uh, I, I think Commissioner McIsaac, McIsaac said it is that, you know, now in the next month, hopefully we can move forward in a more uh, stepwise fashion and have more conversations with more of you. I think it was really challenging that we were only able to really connect with the executive committee um, as we made these decisions. And I think that has left some commissioners feeling really estranged and not, um, not understanding what we considered. And I think that's on Kelly and I to, to do a better job of reaching out to all the commissioners as we make these really consequential decisions that frankly, you guys have to bear the burden of um, along with us. So um, yes. So, I don't, I don't foresee us having uh, public meetings about how to reopen fishing and hunting. I think um, what we foresee doing is um, working through our constituent groups using a process similar to the BPAG or to another group where we can bring people together um, and get people in the problem solving mode. Um, it would be great to have commissioners participate in that. Um, of course, we can't have all y'all in the same meeting. So maybe what, what we need to do is just, uh, I can share with you when we're meeting and then, uh, you know, the first four, that, first four that reply get in the door and we do something else for the next. I, I'm not sure exactly how to manage that. But, um, but yes, we can certainly share that information. We can share with you the notes that come out of those conversations. The internal piece is as external, is as important as figuring out how we reopen the outdoors because of course they're tightly tied together. Um, 
So yes, we will reach out to you. We will do a better job of communicating with all of you. Um, we will let you know how the meetings go. We will let you know when the meetings are happening and how to participate in them. Um, sort of the, the key people to help us do that is gonna be our lands. I mean, one of our challenges is that we, just to put this out there, sort of a challenge facing us is that there is an enormous amount of pent up demand for our fishing, our hunting and our access areas and our wildlife areas. And, um, you know, how to reopen that without not leading to chaos is a little bit of a question mark for all of us internally. Um, and, you know, the idea I think, uh, uh, Commissioner McIsaac mentioned, you know, uh, you know, have 10 people go to this place or 10 people go to that place. And I don't know how we do that literally. So these are, these are ideas that we are also thinking about that we will uh, consider going forward. And uh, finally, just wanted to appreciate um, Commissioner Baker on the, uh, the zebra quagga piece. And I have one more update actually. Um, the governor is going to have a press conference today at 3 p.m. to discuss outdoor recreation. Um, so we can tune into that as well and sort of see what, what his thoughts are. So that's at 3 p.m. today, it'll be on TVW. Um, I just got an email about that. So any, anything else, Chair Carpenter, that I, didn't, that I didn't speak to? No, I think, I think you covered as much as you could right now. It's been a busy, busy day so far. I, uh, um, I'm not gonna try and dictate how it's done, but I, I would hope that the staff with your leadership can communicate with the commissioners uh, uh, more regular, more often, more thoroughly as we go forward. Um, with trying to figure out a way to reinstitute some of the activities that our customer base depends on. And, and I say that also from the position that uh, I know it's hard for government to take on a marketing strategy. And I think I raised it in one of the co uh, executive uh, committee discussions we had. Uh, I think it's incumbent upon staff to be very, very proactive in their planning so that we don't find out the governor's going to announce tomorrow that everything's wonderful and we're not ready for it. I, and because there is going to be some really important logistical support and some content. Well, you, you know what I'm talking about. We need to be ready to go before it's time to go. So uh, thank you for that, Amy. And please uh, don't hesitate to reach out to any of any of us if we can be helpful. Thank you. I appreciate that. As we move to closure here, I just want to take a moment and I want to thank uh, the Ross strategic people and particularly Tess and Melissa for, uh, uh, for their help. It's been an interesting experience. Uh, I'm not very good at it yet, but I'm learning and I, I might want to do it this way all the time. And, uh, and also I want to make sure to, to uh, thank uh, our gal Nikki for a great job. And uh, uh, Amy, please let the staff all involved, even the ones behind the scene, that we, we do appreciate uh, their work and effort and, and uh, engagement. I, I also want to reach out to uh, all of my colleagues on the commission and thank them for their involvement in some really, really difficult times and, and good comments and I, I think good decisions. And uh, I'm almost done, folks. Uh, and I do want to conclude with a happy Easter and safe Easter for all of you. And Brad, you can wake up now. I see you back there in the corner. And uh, uh, last word is uh, uh, Joe Pinesco, if you're still there, I'd like to have a call from you on Monday on a couple items that I need to get, read the tea leaves on, if you may. No hurry, not a panic. Okay. So if there is no objection, it is 104 on Friday. I move to adjourn the virtual meeting of the Washington State Fish and Wildlife Commission. Thank you all for your work. Thanks, guys. Here. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, now.